Take it away, Laura, Brian, and Pat. All right. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well in this nice fall day. We're just talking about apple harvest and uh, the the we'll be right unique problems of having a huge harvest two years in a row is that we don't have enough places to put them. So we need that. You're, yeah, everybody, everybody go buy some apples and eat them. <laughs> Sides counts, hard cider counts, all the things. <laughs> go for the cider. Go for the cider. <laughs> there we go. Cider counts. All right. Um, I don't believe we have quorum in the room. I'm not seeing. We do not have. We do not have nine voting members in the room. So um, we are going to uh, amend our agenda just a little bit. Um, what I will ask everybody in the room to do to make sure that uh, folks who are online know who's participating. Uh, we're going to ask everybody to in the room to go ahead and introduce yourselves and. Uh, we'll roll on from there. So, Dave, do you want to get us started? Sure. Uh, Dave Hamilton, a retired from the Ministry Conservancy. James Swift, Deputy Director, Evil. Um, I'm Grace Gilbert with the uh, uh, Michigan Groundwater Association. I'm Frederick, representing the Michigan Groundwater Association. Kelly Turner, Michigan Casino Industry Commissioner. Ben Table, Michigan Water Group. Ben Staskavich, American Waterworks Association. I'm Laura Campbell with Michigan Farm Bureau. I'm Brian Burroughs with Michigan Trout Unlimited. Abby Eaton with Michigan Department of Agriculture and World Development. Adam Zwickel from Michigan State University. Um, Brianne Hammondry with Jackson Solutions. Dan Arnett with Eagle. Should know on Eagle Water Resources. Katie Lindstrom with Fire Engineering Company. Great. I think Chris Alexander just stepped out for a moment, so she will be back. She's also participating in the meeting. Jim, have you got the folks? Uh, recorded online who are participating remotely. Because I think we do not have to go through and identify where everybody's calling. Yeah, right. So yeah, okay. Looks like Jeremiah Asher. Simon Belisle, Margaret Bettenhausen, Megan Cameron, Bridget Carver, Young Suck Dung, oh, I pronounced that right, yep. Doug Needham, Grant Poole, John Yelich, Clay Chapri, Lyndon Kelly, Andy LeBaron, Lena Pappas, Proctor, Howard Reeves, and Rick, Rick Soul. I've got a few others on here. Uh, Steve Kohler, Sherry Thalen. Uh, I also have Todd Feenstra, Tom Frazier, and Austin York. A few more just joining us here. Every well, they've got to be voting voting members to form. Yeah. Who we got standing outside the door? <laughs> we're just hold on for just a second, folks who are online. We're just trying to figure out if maybe we do have quorum in the room after all. No, we're I mean, yeah. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves as you're coming in and, and grabbing a seat? And let's uh, let's grab some more chairs. Maybe we can just yeah. squeeze in a little. We're going to wrap up like their table over there. So. Okay. David Matura, Michigan Lakes and Streams Association. Megan Tinsley, Michigan Environmental Council. Megan Napier, AKC Fearless. She's soon to be a member, but not confirmed yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, AKT, uh, Brian Eggers, as you guys know, uh, he retired at our meeting this summer. He announced that uh, that he was going to have uh, Megan, Megan yeah. 
sorry, uh, Megan fill in for him. Um, I think if there's not an objection, I'm going to consider that to be quorum. <laughs> You know, my dog got skunked this morning. I have to celebrate every win. <laughs> All right. Okay, so since not hearing any objections, um, I'm going to consider we have in person forum. Um, in that case, uh, I'm going to ask if there's any objections to the current agenda. Hopefully everybody received that uh, via the email that Sherry Thalen sent out. Sure, I don't have an objection, but I would like to add an item. Okay. We had a, uh, an email that was uh, sent to us to the entire council, and I've got a couple questions on it. Sorry. I do not. I've got an agenda that has a couple questions. Okay. Uh, so can you specify which email? It was. Not that I have an objection. I just want to make sure we're clear on what we're doing, what we're adding to the agenda. Okay. Um, I I also wanted to know if there was a place where we could discuss kind of um, committee formats and recordings and making sure we're all on the same page with that. Make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing things with the, and the changes and rules with reporting, what can be sure, what can be sure, where it's placed at, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, Laura, it's a um, September 29th email from Sherry Hill, and there was attached to it in an anonymous committee. Okay. For us. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Do you want to see that? Yep, I will do that. All right. Uh, what we'll do is, Dave, if you if you don't have an objection to it, we'll cover that email during um, during open public comment. Okay. We'll consider that to be an open public comment. So okay. that so we'll we'll bring this up as our as our final open comment okay. uh, period. All right. So yeah. and then we'll cover uh, we'll cover committee recordings during the during the committee updates. Does that work? All right. So since we do have a uh, in-person forum, we've got a fairly large number of uh, committee meetings that we've held, minutes that are not official until they get approved. Um, we have meetings from February 14th, April 11th, June 13th, and August 8th which we did not have in-person forum. We still held a meeting. Um, what we want to do is in the interest of transparency, we would like to see if there's any corrections or edits or amendments that need to be made to the to those meeting notes and to be able to approve those so that they can so that they can be posted uh, and noted that they did not have in-person quorum at the time, but we want to make sure and share the information that was provided at those meetings. Yeah, so um if I had any unrelated really ones, I sent those in. Yep. Uh, on the August one, I just had a couple of corrections. Okay. So Rich Bowman is my alternate, my alternate the council, and she should be there with such. Jim Nicholas is no longer on the council, and uh, Katie Lindstrom is now representing uh, uh, Jim's position in the uh, council. Oh, okay. She was, okay. She was going at the end of July. So. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. Any other amendments or corrections that folks made? Uh, if you've sent something in by email earlier, we do have that on file. We'll make sure that those corrections get put in put in place. But I guess in particular, since we haven't had a lot of chance to talk uh, since the August meeting, I'll, I'll focus primarily on that one. If there's any other corrections that folks want to make or if there's anybody online who has a correction that you want to make. You can go ahead and raise your hand or unmute. One um, correction on the August meeting minutes on item 10, the open comments from John Yelich. Just a typo. Um, it says um, 560,00 wells. I think that might be 560,000. Yes. 
Okay, so clarifying 560,000, not, not 56,000. You did one more zero. It's supposed to be 560,000. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Important distinction to make, so thank you. <laughs> All right, any other amendments or corrections to those to those notes from those earlier meetings? And again, we'll note that we didn't have in-person quorum for those, but we do want to make sure and, and share as much as possible of the committee's discussions that. So we do want to still make sure that those get posted so that people can review them. Make a motion that we approve the February, April, June, and August 2023 meeting notes. As, as amended? As amended. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, we don't officially operate by Robert's rules here, but I'll ask if there's any objections to approving those minutes with the note that uh, that we'll make sure and, and keep in mind that those did not have quorum, but we do want to make sure and share the discussion. All right, hearing none. Awesome. Oh, we'll start to feel like a real meeting. Uh, <laughs> um, we have the we have the additional items on the agenda. So what I will ask for at this point is if anybody's got public comment on the agenda items that are listed for today. So uh, as you guys remember, we do have two public comment periods. There's one at the beginning here that we're doing right now that's uh, up that we would like to dedicate to folk that to stuff that's on the agenda. We'll have another open comment period for anything that people want to bring up. And that will be toward the end of the meeting. So any any public comments on agenda items? I am seeing none. I'm not seeing anything online. OK, well, at this point, then I will turn it over to Brian. We'll go on to our next agenda item and start many reports. Sounds good. Committee chair reports. Um, and yep, so data committee is the first one. Um, we do not have much report. We did not meet since the last. Um, we will be sending out schedulers for the remainder of the year to kind of line up our meetings. Um, if anybody has suggestions for, for new topics um, that the data committee should discuss, review, please uh, email those in. Um, once we get the meeting dates scheduled, we'll be figuring out the agendas for each of the meetings and kind of grouping things. And we have we have a few things on our list, um, not not the longest list in the world, but we have a few things on there still we need to follow up on. So there is room if there are important issues, uh, any of the members here that need to be addressed by the committee, please. You know, let's say in the next week and a half, roughly uh, send. Megan or I a note, and we'll make sure that it's all smacked together with the agendas. Megan? Yeah, Megan, you're on mute. Any questions for the, on the data committee? I'll email you and Megan. Um, we should have a discussion about the RFP for the prioritizing additional data collection. You don't have to send me an email on that. That's one of the one that's that is one of the clear few ones on our list. Thank you, Jim. Okay, moving on. Um, models committee. All right. Um, Michael for data committee. Not having meetings. We've had some meetings with a lot of attendants. We've had over 30 people attending, which is phenomenal. Um, but before I get into that, I want to first of all thank Jim Nicholas for his service on the council for four years and has been co-chair on models committee. I'd also like to announce that Katie Lindstrom has agreed to be the co-chair of my host committee, so I'm very pleased that, uh, to have her in that position because we, that's very important for you. It's good to have some people good day class with this in the chair positions. So I'll make sure that the council do that. Okay, so we're continuing to look at a possible replacement for method regulating the portion screen flow dictation that's used in the screening tool. And we're looking at a method that was specifically designed to improve the method that we have. So it, it is uh, built on what we've already been using. 
And you may recall that our current method does have an error in it. So as we continue to use it, we found the error every time we're reducing that. So it would be nice to, uh, to either fix that or to adapt to that. You have something. From a technical point of view, this web squared method we've been talking about uh, looks very sound. And we've been, had, we've been having discussions about uh, field verification, though there's some interest in doing that. We need to look at that. It's like, if it can be done, how it be done, and so on. So we're talking about that. We've also talked a little bit about how a new method will be implemented, and it looks like um, we can have uh, we can come up with a very reasonable sort of approach to implement it if we decide to make that recommendation. So um, the the main thing, well, we don't have a recommendation yet from the committee, but this is what we've been working on. So I hope um, in the near future that we will have a recommendation. And right now, the biggest sticking point is whether or not we can be nice and good work, which is setting the We're also looking at uh, having a presentation on the site specific review process and we're looking at the details of that. I've got a meeting set up with uh, Todd and with, with Jim to talk about that in some detail. And we are planning at this point to have uh, a presentation in December and it's December meeting. And I think that that's, uh, that is doable. So we have been very closely following the process in implementing the funded recommendations for 2020. And as you all recall, we were very fortunate to have full funding for our recommendations. Very glad to have that. Uh, but there was so much money in that it's been slow getting things started. So we've been following the process and trying to bird dog a little bit to encourage uh, things to move along. Uh, so the ones that are out of the models committee, the Michigan Hydrobody uh, Framework, is very close. So uh, there's some budget details that need to be worked out, but I think that's the last issue. And um, and I think we'll be able to start moving forward on that. We already have a work group set up within the models committee to work closely with that team that will be working on the Michigan Hydrology Framework. So we very much look forward to that moving forward. The Michigan Integrated Water Management Database, uh, Dave Blush and I had a um, very productive discussion with the uh, EO staff, including a couple of department directors. Uh, we were able to clarify that our proposal is consistent with, not contradictory to, and not duplicate of all the groundwater database that the department's forming. We very much support the work that the department wants to do with the groundwater database, but we also uh, need to get this uh, water management database going that fits in perfectly with the Michigan Hydrology Framework and will um, Help facilitate getting that moving along rapidly. So um, we hope to keep that moving along. Um, discussion was good, but it's not final. And we'll have to a way to get it implemented. We think that can be um, tagged along with the Michigan Environment and Family because it is something that's closely related. We're also looking at the traditional transitional probability methodology. We had a presentation in the committee meeting um, about that. Methodology and an ARP is very close to being completed on that. We're also looking at compiling the aquifer properties. Um, that, that's going through some internal review with an eagle, and once that's done, we'll be verified. That's not a very complex um, proposal, so we'll hopefully, we'll see this to be RP in pretty quickly. Uh, for our, our 2022 recommendations, we're actually pretty modest. Um, but when I was talking to the department, I found out that um, none of the council recommendations for 2022 have been funded. Um, and so I thought I would be very quickly what would get proposed and just want to talk about who we might want to go from here. There are two from the models committee, both dealing with downstream accounting. Uh, they were for a little bit more than $400,000 over two years. Um, there was one from the data committee was dealing with the developing an in the lake uh, PRI conceptual framework, also for a couple hundred thousand dollars. So between the three of those, it was a little over six hundred thousand uh, dollars. There's one for water use efficiency in a pilot study that was six hundred thousand dollars over a three-year period. So the total of new funding that we as a council were looking for was a little bit over one point two million dollars. So it's a relatively modest sum. And we're pretty disappointed that it wasn't funded. But I think we have to figure out if there's a way to look for it or do something about that. Um, I have assumed. Sorry, Dave, before you continue on that, um, James, do you want to cover budget stuff 
when you get to when we get to Eagles update, or do you want to speak to the budget issues now while Dave's brought it up? Um, again, I'm not going to have much to add yet. I don't know if Jim Young will have anything, but I mean, the bottom line is, is that everything he said so far is true, I believe. <laughs> um, but again, it's a matter of it. The legislature didn't fund it. We don't get to fund it. So, um, I guess maybe what 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 I think would be helpful for the council is to understand what the legislature did appropriate for Eagle and for the water use program and what that is going to be used for for the next fiscal year. And the primary thing funded was the groundwater database. Um, that was the primary um, item funded in the in last year in this year's budget and kind of going forward and give it a little bit of more details, but. So, and again, that is going to be an integral part where we're moving forward is kind of combining all of the separate kind of people did. This is in one place where we're really hopefully be able to be kind of used with that more efficiency, efficiently moving forward. Um, I don't think anything other than that was included in this year's budget. So, again, they, they were aware that we were still working through the money from last year, uh, not that we didn't, you know, we have to. They made their own decisions, but um, I think that's I think that's all I had. Okay. The last thing that is related to the budget is like I'm assuming that the biggest chunk of our fund funding was continuous continued funding, which geological survey is the biggest chunk of that. I assume that was funny because I had on John knowledge screen. So that's and can you can you give us a, a confirmation or a, or a scream of despair? <laughs> It was fun. Okay. So I mean, John's having trouble with his movie, but, but I okay. mean, that is a, a $3 million ongoing yeah. project line. It's my yep. recollection. Okay. Yeah. It, they, it's ongoing until the legislature says otherwise. We just no, want to make okay. sure that they have to say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> and that was, um, that funding line was. That was a different and discrete one from the one bucket that Eagle got for groundwater. Yes. Okay. And then um, I guess to, to with the with the efficiency pilot, that's kind of tied in a little bit with the uh, money that was appropriated for the extension educator role at MSU, right? So completely separate. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I hate to get I yeah, I'm I'm disappointed about that too. And I guess that's maybe something to to put on our radar for you know maybe next maybe our next meeting uh is kind of looking at the looking at the schedule of when the legislature is going to start discussing next budgets and when we can get when we can get an opportunity to to be able to either organize uh you know some some testimony time or or reach out to some legislators and help them understand the ongoing need for uh for these funding pieces I and mean, just a quick um, um tutorial for everyone the budget season never ends <laughs> so so we are currently at the beginning of the executive branch preparing its executive budget for next year so they're moving more input from the department already okay on uh, any kind of changes from this year's budget they basically developed that between now and the beginning of the year, sometime in January. They package it all up. The governor announces it uh, right on February. Um, so that's the then kind of the legislative stuff kind of kicks off after that. Mm -hmm. but, but the executive branch and the state budget office is already in the first steps of developing next this year's election. Okay. And is that something that uh, our new Eagle director is kind of aware of the council and its recommendations, or is that something that we need to have a conversation about? Um, he's aware, not to say that it would, you know, kind of further to kind of articulate kind of, you know, those items. It always helps, um, you know, to, to see some you know, recommendations regarding prioritizations and things like that. Um, given kind of there's some uncertainty, of course, going into the next budget between kind of the ongoing moment of uh, worker strikes and some other things about kind of available funding. So, um, again, any kind of thoughts on prioritization is always kind of welcome advice from the from the council. Okay. Mike. Okay. 
would it make sense to maybe to invite the director at our next meeting, which is December or something? Mm -hmm. December 12th. Yeah, again, I mean, it's a uh, we, we can check with him, but but again, I I could see you know he is not the only decision maker in the executive branch. Let's so leave it at that. I so we we we. James, the point is going to talks go. You know, when you sit in front of uh, you know you're sitting in front of big important people and they say, "Give me your top three, and you know. That was part of the reason why the council was reorganized to report directly to the leg legislature, so we didn't have to necessarily only have, you know, losing out on priorities in other areas. Just a clarification, when I started coming to these meetings last last year, it was indicated that we had a $2 million package that we were asking to be funded. Is this shortfall part of that $2 million? I completely lost. In so so our 20 recommendation that was fully funded. That was 10 some million dollars. Okay. 2022, we made a recommendation for about 1.2 million plus the ongoing funding for uh, Michigan Geological Survey, which is a separate kind of a separate pot of money. That's about three million dollars a year uh, for their mapping projects. Um, so the 1.2 million is what we're talking about right now that has not been funded by the legislature, at least as of yet. Okay, and that was for this fiscal year or uh, right. We made the recommendation year. at the very end of 2022. So it would have been in, it would have been for fiscal year 2023 okay. recommendations. But never say die. We can ask for it for 24. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks for just trying to keep all the numbers. No, that's a good question. And Dave, sorry to derail your, oh, I was, I was your report. I, <laughs> you you were disappointed about it, so I figured you wouldn't mind too much. Wait. No, I it's good to talk about and more important strategize. Yeah, I think it's a good it's a good lesson for all of us that we'll have to regroup on it. And I think we were all hoping that given kind of the general phraseology of the appropriation of Eagle that that there may be some funding sufficient to move the 2022 recommendations out of that bucket. We didn't know, but now we know. And um, I think it's it's. It, it's on us now to assemble and make sure that we do our own unique advocacy uh, to get the the funding for the 2022 recommendations. Let me, let me just add kind of one kind of new item that's been added in the kind of budget mix this year. And just keep in mind going forward, which is for every legislative earmark, we now don't have authorized to spend it until we get kind of further instruction from the legislature or you know we kind of created it um so there's kind of an additional process kind of tags on the end because sometimes boilerplate language maybe isn't as clear as it could be um the duration of the that us a little bit more detail regarding kind of the intent of the legislature with the debate here for our funds going forward is that can be an official thing? Is that like really sponsor? That was that applied across all budgets, not just the equal budget. And and I would not be surprised to see it to be a continued competition. So when you when when the department had to undertake that process for this this chunk of funding it received, none of the legislators spoke up and said I had intended uh, X portion of that bucket to go towards the water council recommendations. No, no, yeah, these are all separate earmarks where in the boilerplate says, you know, as from the line, A, so much is for this purpose. So, you know, again, unless there's kind of a, you know, that's the type of earmark that they now have to give us kind of more information and be very concise about what they're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, Doug, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. I do. Thanks. So I guess my question comes then is whose responsibility is it to make sure that we have that earmark or the section of the budget? You know, we give the report to the legislators, we present on it, then who, what entity? Is it us as the council that has to go lobby to get an earmark in it? Or are we getting that earmark through the department in their request? So I'll take a sh shot and then I can stand to be corrected. Um, <clears throat> so I think the responsibility to advocate to get that funding recognized and, and supported is on us, the water council. 
I think we learned that in the past. Um, I think when they, if we are successful and they grant it, they usually do it and assign it and put it in the Eagle budget uh, to be implemented. But I think that through time we can hope, right? And and I think James has extended the offer and the advice, but I mean, we can go and advocate with the director. Um, the director is going to have a variety of internal requests that have different levels of priority and they only can put so many forward uh, every single year. And so we can certainly advocate with the department and we probably should. Um, and I think that's justified as well. But at the end of the day, I think the past has told us that it is on us as the water use council members to advocate for the investments we're approaching. And when we don't do that, um, we run a risk of not getting not getting it. And and you know, this past one, you know, it was a bit of a dicey on season um, for the 2020 recommendations, we had ample opportunity we requested and we were given chances to come in, present, speak with um, people during the budget process. And the last one that didn't really happen. Um, so we, I don't believe any of us really ever got in to testify at a formal committee at them. No, and I think and, and, and I, I agree. I think part of that was just the product of a new legislature coming in and having to figure a lot of things out with, you know, a one point two million dollar budget request being pretty low on the totem pole of priority. But I think we have an opportunity uh, as this winter season progresses, particularly for all of our organizations who do lobby. Um, and I know not not everybody does and not everybody's allowed to. Uh, so I don't want to put pressure on people who are like, you know, when you're saying, wait a minute, I'm not allowed to do that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> We're not asking you to if you if that's not your role. Um, but I do think that that's our opportunity for, for those folks who do lobby to to start reaching out uh, now that the legislature's got their feet under them a little bit and start making some noise. Well, I think so. Will will we have a plan of attack to do that then moving into the twenty four? If if James right now says that that's at the beginning stage, I mean, is that and w w what's our plan for that? How do we help? Look like a topic for the new topics committee. <laughs> um, I, you know, there's a lot of ways that we could go about it, and I, and I know that um, a lot of the people here that participate in this, um, who who engage in advocacy uh, and or lobbying, often do make calls, and we did over the 2022. We have conversations on a normal basis. I I think for me, a little bit of the lesson is if you know. And this isn't statistically significant, but the times we don't get into formally as water council representatives speak to committees, we don't usually fare that well on the on the other side. So I know a bunch of us, you know, definitely talk with legislators and key positions about the recommendations, but I think we have to make sure that we are formally pushing and repushing and repushing to get in to do some formal outreach um, to all the committees that are relevant and I think whenever we kind of hope uh, that the need is clear and, and we don't get invited to committees, we should start having some doubt whether we'll be successful. So I think moving forward pretty quickly, we need to kind of um, develop a strategy and and, um, and we'll do a little conversation um, to figure out the comfortable and appropriate way to do that, recognizing not all of you are comfortable or able to uh, advocate um, in, in all ways, but we'll have to do that amongst all of us who are able, comfortable doing that and come up with a strategy to, to get our needs and our recommendations back to them. Uh, Doug, I have a proposal. Um, can we maybe take uh, time at our next implementation committee meeting and work out some talking points and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and some script ideas for calls and letters that folks can send in and bring those to the December Water Use Council meeting and and let that be a, a suggested template. I okay. like it. Yep, I like it. Well, I'm done. Any questions? Any questions about the models? <laughs> Not seeing any, I would just say thank you um, for the, the busy work and the good work that's being done in the water. Uh, okay, we'll shift over to new topics committee. Um, we do not have any new topics to discuss. So we didn't need 
Good, good enough. Uh, as a reminder, again, if there are issues that come up um, to any of your group's perspectives on this topic and you think that it uh, is worthy of some discussion, it, it's always appropriate to send those to, to new topics. You can always, of course, send them to the executive committee or raise them here, but you know, the new topics committee just for kind of new issues to be talked about, figured out, figure out where they go or how to approach them. So take full use of that committee. The only outstanding topic we had on that was the economically or environmentally feasible. And I can't remember the phrase. Um, there's an exception in there, and it's if those person can prove that the solution that is environmentally um, sound and economically feasible, then the department will ex you know, consider that. We were going to maybe go down that road of trying to get better definition of what those two broad terms mean, um, but we didn't go too much further. So I don't know, Jim, if there's any burning desire to take that back on the ground, but um, that's anything that we kind of had somewhat in mind. Okay. Any other questions for the new topics committee? Yes, thank you. So the work that Adam and the, that group is doing at MSU, I think that originated in the new topics committee. Is, that, is there some a different group that's kind of overseeing that now? I mean, there has been a transition away from new topics to a different group. Well, that's a, a grant that was being funded by EO. Can see grant, so it's a separate and on its own, and we'll be reporting to that. Once it's complete, I'm sure there'll be a presentation to the degree of views going forward. But I mean, I didn't plan it now. That at some point in time, it may be appropriate to reestablish a water users that that would be a discussion for the council. Um, but I don't think that I mean, new talks or new topics is really meant to just hey, we've got we don't want something to die. Let's find a home for it. Um, I do think that conservation efficiency needs to be seen as an issue that. Just good but, clarification, right? Like yeah. it started here and I didn't understand where it transitioned to other places. Yeah, new, I mean, as a as a reminder, um, the statute itself doesn't really speak in any detail to our committees if we choose to have the take it since we can have committees. And um, but other than that, it, it's what we want to do based on our needs. And um, so, you know, a couple what, four four and a half five years ago or whenever it was when they set out on this iteration of the council. We took our guesses of um, some of the standing committees that we should have, and I think the topics was sort of a, a little bit of a catch-all, like you said, and um, at least an initial home that could, um, you know, spend a little time with an issue and then figure out how whether it's a full council issue or a particular other committee. But as a reminder, as we go forth, depending on what we handle and what's in front of us, if, if there's a topic that we're not really covering with one of the committees, so say it was like a water users type of an issue. Uh, we can discuss and come up with whatever we want to do, and that can be creating a new committee uh, and, or everybody approves it. We could expand the scope of an existing committee that it, we think it sort of fits into. Or we can just say we would like to assign that to you know different committee, even though it doesn't really fit. But hey, we think it's just going to be the only one like that for a while, so we'll just handle it. Um, we can kind of do whatever we need to do to handle the business and as far as students. Uh, question from Emily or comment. Go ahead, Emily. Brian, I would just suggest that um, since the integrated assessment project is underway and it came from uh, the new topics committee and was a subgroup that I was and I think Pat and I were co-chairing under the new topics committee. I think we should just discuss um, in the implementation committee what uh, what process makes sense, um, whether a new committee or a subgroup needs to be formed uh, to to continue to be engaged on projects that are being implemented that were funded under 
the Water Use Advisory Council recommendations or you know, part of the previous legislative report. So I feel like this is maybe another agenda item for discussion for the implementation committee. Good recommendation. And I understand your point. Um, we don't want to lose sight of, of that recommendation. Um, I'm just not sure. Um, at some point in time, when, back in 2012, we had five committees and water users group was a standing committee because it is such a friendly topic. So um, mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling that once this um, grant is completed and, and the report is done, that there may be the need to have more of a working group and take that forward. The same question has kind of been in my mind of um, we, we have an advisory committee for the integrated assessment project. <laughs> I think we should work through that process um, and not, not create another group that's meeting at the same time that's maybe different than that advisory committee. But I think if we talk in the implementation committee about what process makes sense once that um, project is completed, there's a draft report, a final report presented back to the LUAC, then Maybe it, it does make sense to just create that group, um, you know, later on in the integrated assessment project process. Thank you, Paul. Excellent. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other comments. We yeah, have jump in quick for new topics. We'll move on to the uh, conservation and efficiency committee. Today. That's, I'm going to give the report, and Emily is my backup. So if I screw anything up, she can hop on later and correct me. Um, really, uh, we continue to meet monthly. Uh, the Office of the Great Lakes is currently coordinating the 2023 Water Conservation and Efficiency Program's annual assessment report uh, in the development of that. And so they're working with contributions from Eagle, MDAR, DNR, and a list of others uh, that Emily is aware of. So. Uh, we have spent quite a bit of time in the committee through our last few meetings uh, doing a review of the Alliance for Water Efficiency scorecard from 2022. Uh, we were pretty dismally ranked uh, in the bottom 10 on that. And so as we started to dig in, we watched uh, some videos on how is that scorecard put together and how do they use it? It created a lot more questions for folks in our group about, you know, uh, Who's, who's filling out this report? Because there were others who felt like the state did have some compliance in some of the areas that the questions addressed, but we received zero points for that. So really looking at um, other states that have been able to really up their scorecard numbers, what have they done specifically? And are there things that we as a committee could put forward uh, to help the state have uh, maybe move from the bottom 10 to the top 10 uh, in that scorecard? Um, and, and really? yes, so, um, what is this alliance for water efficiency? It is a group of people who are really uh, promoting um, policy, I would say, in water efficiency at state level. So there's a, an, a there's a huge scorecard. We can share with you guys the the link to it, um, and then you can see they they group different areas. And you can see where Michigan, you know, at a certain number of points, a lot of times we received zero. So that caused us some concern in those areas. Um, I think just looking at it uh, for myself, I did send some, some thoughts to the group. So with the money from the last year, I think we're going to be able to say, yes, there are state funding for these certain things where in the past we didn't have state funding for them. And none of this. Uh, this is all looked at at a state level. So there may be communities and townships and, and uh, counties that are doing some of this work and have money that they're putting into some of these programs, but if it's not at a state level, then it doesn't count, right? Is, are these uh, sort of industries involved in this, or are there involved in it, local government? Or... Uh, I think it's an independent organization. Emily might have more insights on the makeup uh -huh. of this. The, the scorecard is one product that is, comes out of um, out of AWD, but they also track uh, conservation practices across the industries. They also are proponents of those practices among the, the states, in, in addition to tracking 
to know what states are actually implementing on a policy level regarding uh, conservation and efficiency practices. Uh, Howard just posted the link for the Alliance for Water Efficiency. Um, Bree, if you don't mind grabbing that when you get a chance and maybe putting it in with the, with the minutes draft, then, then that way folks can uh, kind of link to that when they're reviewing the notes here. And I think I saw that I heard that Simon was on. Simon, could you post the link that takes them directly to Michigan's scorecard so it, it's less fishing around for you guys to, to look at? I don't know if it's a question for you or anybody else who's really familiar. I, I, I get the sense some others are probably like me or haven't heard of AWD. Um, has this been occurring, this kind of annual scorecard for some time? And if it yes. has, yes. It has, is this result like errant from where we've been um, before? They, they do this about every five years. Um, I think it was like 2012, 17, and now this one. Um, this, this alliance is based out of Chicago, and it's kind of a Midwest group. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. if anybody has any more information, but um, it does have some municipal ties. I think there were some people that had ties with municipalities that wanted to push that issue. Um, it does have business and other ties, but it's really just a group of folks that are really um, into promoting water efficiency. And, and so that, that's their niche and, and they're doing what they can to that. Um, we looked at this report card five years ago and it is what it is. Any type of report card just like ACE report card on the bridges and roads and stuff, you're making a lot of assumptions. And, and so I'm going to dive into the details. You know, you can pull those apart and make, make um, you know, your own suggestions on how they can be better. But the point is, is they're just trying to move the ball forward on this topic. So I think there's a way that we could you know, reach out to them and try to get a better understanding of some tools that are available, but it's, you know, water conservation efficiency is really region specific. So your solution is not universal and one size all one size fits all is going to apply to that. But I think they also compare to other compounds. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we definitely want to be living up to table higher and, neighbors in the continent. And remember that these are, you know, it, it's a report based on answers to very specific and pointed questions. Right. So they're very directed. It doesn't really allow for, you know, expansion on how you answer it. I know when Frank was here, we would be sort of frustrated. Right, right. right. <laughs> so it looks like Simon has posted the link directly to the report card. If you if you don't mind grabbing that as well. And Emily, do you mind uh do you mind telling us about the the statement from AWE that you posted in the chat. I want to make sure that we're that we're able sure. to get that on our reporting and not losing the stuff that gets posted in the chat because I'm not sure, sure how well <laughs> captures that. Yeah, sorry, I was I'm was not putting my hand up, but I was struggling to jump in here. So yeah, Alliance for Water Efficiency is a nonprofit organization. They're stakeholder based and they're they're as folks have said, they're dedicated to um advancing and advocating for water efficiency and sustainable use of water. Um so they provide uh, the scorecard is one of the um, tools that they use to evaluate specifically policies in states across the U.S. Uh, but they also have a number of resource educational resources for um, different water users, um, and they have been heavily involved in the Great Lakes Compact um, since you know uh, early 2000s. So um, they're a pretty well known organization. Um, we did invite Ron Burke, their um, CEO, to speak to the committee earlier in the year when the scorecard was released. And um, I think we're, you know, we're at a point now where it's a good time to take a look at what's in the scorecard. Some of the other Great Lakes states have significantly increased their score, which I, has been interesting to us. And we want to understand what um, what kinds of things they were able to do or uh, help the Alliance understand more fully about their program. So New York, for example, has moved up um, to, I think, number six. They're in the they're in the top 10 now and several other Great Lakes states are. So um, I think it's a it's a tool to look at. Um, it shouldn't necessarily drive all of our programming, but I think uh, we want to take a look at it, make sure that the way that Michigan's being scored is, um, is as accurate as it can be. And if there are some things that we could be doing, um, we can t talk further about those as a committee to see if they're appropriate for recommendations or things that you know could be done outside of just recommendations so 
Um, so what I posted was just what was on their uh, website about their organization. And they, they did host an annual, their first annual symposium in Chicago. That's where they're based uh, this August. We weren't able to attend it this year, but um, we are planning on inviting folks from um, Wisconsin and New York to come meet with the committee and just talk about their water conservation efficiency programs and um, some of the scorecard work that they may be involved in. Minnesota's expert in this area has since left that position. So um, the person we were going to go to is sort of a guru isn't there. So they have a new person coming on board. But um, this is something the committee is looking at uh, to see where there may be some opportunities. Great. Thank you. That makes sense. I mean, you know, like having a group that's broad spatially look at this stuff, you want to make sure that they're accurately giving you an assessment address those, but if, you know, once that's taken care of and it's, you feel it's a more accurate assessment, you know, if there's, a, like you said, if, or Emily said, if there's other states that are scoring very well, if that's, I think that's the part of the scorecard report that should get prominently communicated. What is it that's working in a couple other places that we're not seeing from afar? And, and some and, states are choosing, even in the Great Lakes region, to become members, so um, I think Ohio, when I was at the Compact Council meeting, they um, recently reported that they've joined as a member. So there's some there's some member benefits. I think it's it, this, you know, along with like the EPA Water Sense program. There's there are some existing tools and best practices and resources that are great to look at to see um, where they may fit Michigan's context and may help us advance our efforts. Any other questions before we leave that time? Because the rest of our report really is just kind of where we are on those 2020 recommendations. So uh, the recommendation to advance Michigan's water conservation and efficiency efforts through state climate, energy, and water infrastructure initiatives. Try to remember that without reading it. <laughs> um, uh, back into 2020. So Office of the Great Lakes has developed the RFP um, and uh, to fund one project for $100,000. So the RFP was released on June 28th. They held a webinar on July 25th to kind of explain the process, answer questions. Um, and then applications were due Monday, August 28th. So they are currently reviewing those applications and they have had a recommendation for one applicant for that award. So the project uh, start date is expected to be around December 1st. Yeah. Then I think the next slide is the other recommendation we had for the conservation and efficiency practices in agriculture. That is uh, moving forward. So NDARD and MSU have provided their final plan of work to the committee for review. That currently is within EGLE for them to, to work through their uh, inner workings. MSU did uh, post the positions. They The hiring process is underway. We can share with you um, the date of those. And then there's also an invitation. So MSU is, uh, does their hiring process very interestingly, where anyone is basically allowed to attend those interviews via, via online. And then you can ask questions later um, and, and really help them, MSU, to in selecting what participants they're uh, going to give the job to. Uh, I, Simon, I think there was a link to that, and we could include that in the minutes here as well, so that if anyone is interested in participating in that, they could do that. So those interviews are tomorrow at the board call. Oh, there are tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. There's tomorrow. They're, they're, there's they're next week. So I, I just wanted to expand. So they do, they do have two candidates that they think would be very good for this position. Those are the folks that are interviewing. Um, one of the challenges we're going to have is that um, one is finishing their degree in December. So it would be a start date of potentially January if these are hired. And the second would not be able to start in this week. And that's just kind of the nature of, you know, the applicant pool at this time. So um, what we were discussing is at least, um, you know, bring deciding who would be on the advisory council and get that established before these folks are on board. So that's already in place. Kind of some of the conversation that's going on, depending on who's hired. But that's kind of the timeline that we're looking at. And hiring 
the hiring process is happening at kind of at the same time as uh, internal approval from ECO. So the, the grant, the grant, the grant has gone out for execution. Perfect. Any questions? Just for clarification, you said something's working through ego. That's the grant. Yeah. The, the WRD. Yeah, you got that's, yeah, that's us. Yeah. So what's working for us? We're reviewing. Uh, so yeah. so the, the review process is done. That's, okay. Right. I just, right, yeah. Right, I want right. to clarify that for them. Right. So this is the ARPA money that's going to be passed. Got it. Yeah, we're hiring. Past we're well past. That. Right. Okay. So we're, we're past that. Okay. Thank you. Grant looks uh looks like you had a comment that you put in the chat. Do you wanna do you wanna unmute and, and talk about your comment? I wanna I wanna try to make sure that we're getting as much of it captured verbally as possible since not everybody is online. Oh, that's right. I was just looking at the scorecard and it showed that most of the points available are in the top three topics. All right, thanks. And then Simon looks like you posted the link to join the interviews, but since they're tomorrow, can people email you if they want to get that link sooner than when the minutes will be available? We can go ahead and send it to Sherry to send out to WUIC. Okay, perfect. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your patience. Uh, yeah. Yep, Emily, did you have anything you wanted to add? Nope, I'm good. <laughs> Any other questions for the conservation and efficiency committee? Right. Moving forward to the implementation committee. Is that or Doug? That's going to have to be Doug because I actually missed our meeting. I had a conflict. <laughs> well, our last meeting we did have was uh, August 3rd. So it was right before our last council meeting. And we did go through and kind of update a lot of kind of the status. It seems like we have to do it again because a number of those initiatives kind of were either waiting for October 1 or the next quarter uh, to take place. Obviously, we got some updates today uh, from the Conservation and Efficiency Committee, so it'd be nice to kind of capture some of those in there. So um, we're continuing to track things are moving forward. Those that don't need funding are continuing to go. Those that have been funded with the 2020 recommendations, I think there's a lot of RFPs and a lot of kind of beginning stages to get things under contract. So. We're monitoring that, um, and as I say, I think we just need to put it in a better summary at this point so that we can capture really where we're at. And then we will add to our kind of agenda uh, ways to, to discuss lobbying or I guess to try to get funding for the 2022 recommendations. And then really should there be another committee formed to follow up on previously approved recommendations uh, that was recommended today. So. We will get a meeting scheduled between now and our next council meeting so that we can provide an updated report. Thank you, Doug. Anybody have any questions? Not hearing any. We'll pause before number seven and we'll shift back over. And, and Kelly had, um, he wanted to post some discussion points about the committees. Thank you. Um, so for some of the questions we've had uh, come up around the recording. So for the Conservation and Efficiency Committee, we record uh, each of our meetings and then we um, put them out on YouTube so anyone with that link has access to them. But then there was an email that came out that said those recordings can't, can't go out unless they're closed captioned. And so we hadn't been doing that. Um, so trying to figure out like what do we are we not allowed to put the links then in our minutes that from our committee that will be posted to the website unless they're closed captioned. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with this. Uh, additionally, so if you're on a seated committee, 
the initial discussion was that we record them so if committee members aren't able to make that meeting, they can review that meeting at a time that works for them to keep them up to speed so that we're not asking redundant questions at you know subsequent meetings and and it keeps every like you heard what was said in the room right it reduces the hearsay but now we're not able to get access to those recordings even if we're a seated committee member um i'm gonna they all need to agree on what the ground rules are so that number one we're following whatever rules the state needs to follow and number two we can be committed to each other because it seems like it, it causes lack of trust with things and it seems like people are trying to hide things when that happens so what are the rules we're going to follow what are what is the commitment to each other i mean somebody clarify if i'm wrong here but i know we're supposed to be running the full council meetings by open meetings act subcommittees we don't have a quorum of voting committee members present there's my understanding is there's not the expectation that those have to follow the same rules as Open Meetings Act. Um, we certainly haven't been public noticing when we have when we have the meetings. Um, is there the obligation that there has to be some specific procedure for recording and posting those those meetings of the of the subcommittees? And I'm kind of looking at our Eagle folks here, and, and maybe Margaret might be able to weigh in. Yeah, A is legally there's no requirement for recording. B, the legal requirement comes, I think, when we post to our YouTube channel. I do not know if it applies if we're just trying to share it with other committee members. That that's I'm not sure the answer to that one. And I had no partner or someone else knows that, but if we post recordings to our our YouTube channel, they have to be accessible. Um, that's a portion of us taking federal funds. You know, that's a requirement. I am not sure if there is an interim step where we could short of posting it to our YouTube channel and share that information in some way. But we could we can find the answer to that question. For clarification, so currently, like our committee is using Michigan Potatoes Zoom mice. And then I upload it to our YouTube channel, but only those with the link can access it. And then we put that right into our minutes and share that back out with our committee members. But we're also sharing that, you know, to go out on the website for whoever wants to see the minutes from our last meetings. So should we not be sharing that link on what we send to be put on the website then? Yeah, check. I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Yeah, I, everything you said is how I understand it, James. Anything that we post on, on our YouTube, we meaning Eagle, must meet ADA. They have to be closed captioned, so that applies to us. I think, and I'm not, I'm not on the um, the meeting. Is Margaret? Is she on? I don't know if Margaret's is. Margaret's on. Do you, Margaret? Are you able to to weigh in on that? And Doug, I know you have a question. We'll. I mean, I, I think we would be able to look into an answer. I, I, I agree if it's Eagle posting and it needs to meet all those requirements. I'm not that familiar with them. Um, but if there's something specific we need to look into, we can do that. I don't think you need to put it on your your um, list. Um, I think we can go to our, um, our support division staff and they'll have the answer to that one for us. So we'll follow up internally. Uh, to get more clarification on this point. Yeah, that's relevant because for the when we record the recording and transcript for the full council meetings, we send over to environmental services division or support division, whatever they are, and they get they do the ADA compliant, and then we post it to the council's web page. But for example, Dave routinely asked me to record teams meetings that we set up for the models committee. So I can start doing that for those recordings. Well, I mean, Jimmy sent you a we sent somebody an email as to what you were doing. I'm surprised that they included. I think this uh, doesn't yeah. have So, so some, I have sometimes. I don't know. Consistently in best practice, that probably I need to be more consistent about doing that. And there's there's 
various um, levels of closed caption kind of software and some meet ABA requirements and some don't. So um, we'll we'll track down a, a more full answer and kind of advance everyone on, on how we can both share but not run into problems with ABA. Good. We, we have a couple of questions accumulating online. So Doug, Needham, you go ahead first, and then I see Emily after that. So Kelly, one of the things you said was, you know, for consistencies and I guess transparency amongst uh, the committee members. And I have no idea how to record. I wouldn't know what to do with it when I was done with it. So it would, to me, just be a, a waste, even if it was push a button. So, but what I do try to do, and in, in at least the implementation committee, we try to make sure we have at least enough representation from amongst all council, interested council people, so that when we do talk, we have at least everyone's ear uh, at the table listening to make sure that we're good. But I don't know if there was really anything said at the beginning that said all committees must do X, Y, and Z. I think yeah. it was just when we set up the committees, it was who wants to participate in what committee. And some of those that are a little bit more technologically advanced um, have stepped into a, a realm that others of us don't know how to do. So long, as, so long as the committees are taking notes or, you know, or at least able to report on what it is that you're doing, I, there's there's no obligation that I understand or expectation that there has to be a certain level of recording of what happened. It's it, it's up to those committees to decide if they want to record their meetings, if they want to take notes, if they want to do other things. Um, I, uh, that's right. Emily, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to the point about <clears throat> the closed captioning. And I, I just think from, from my perspective, if we're recording it, it doesn't really matter who's recording it. If it's getting posted on Eagle's website as part of the WUAC and a, and a committee, it should be closed caption because it still comes across as a, you know, eventually that product that's being posted to the state website is essentially a state product at that time. So I, I just think it should be closed captioned. I don't know that every committee needs to record. I think we started recording because we had speakers and not everybody could always attend and it just helped keep move the discussion forward if folks wanted to watch that speaker. And then at times if Kelly or I couldn't be there, we recorded it just to have a backup for note taking and we could go back and listen and make sure we caught it all. So just my two cents. For the uh, models committee, I almost always had to request from somebody recorded. So we pretty uh, pretty much regular the basis we recorded. And we're kind of on the part of that expertise and taking care of it. So whatever Jim does is how we do it. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit trapped somewhere in there. Um, maybe a little bit better, Doug. Like I know I think it's the report button, but I also don't know what to do exactly for sharing and making it accessible after it's recorded. And I get either a link or I made the mistake of downloading several gigabyte on the Sounds like a new topics topic. <laughs> right up a process, right? It, it's literally is like well, we, we get an answer first on what we're required to do, but then we can discuss what our policy should be made in the next meeting. That, that way we can. And, and don't be afraid if you're doing a little bit of background to you know be honest to the cost um, of, of that, because you know I don't think it's always free to have things. Well, yeah, I see all the oh, time process involved. That would be more judicious. I think part of getting that process will be important. So you know, we know what to include in our minutes, what can be sent to be put on the website, um, and kind of what we need to do. But I also think we need to figure out if it is being recorded, and a sitting member of that committee asks for that recording because they couldn't be at that meeting. Is there an obligation that they get to watch that recording? Well, on that, I, I think there's always like the best practices with each other, trying to keep everybody on the same page. But there's, I don't believe there's any obligation for that. The way the council was initially set up was that there's a member, you can have an alternate, meetings get scheduled, you can't make it, you send an alternate. Um, 
And you know, that always happens, right? Trying to schedule with a large group of people. You can't always make it. I, you know, I always say my doors, my telephone's open. Somebody misses something, they couldn't get somebody there. They want to spend an hour going over what people said and what was covered. You know, I don't share, I mean, I don't hide anything. And then of course, like, you know, Dave's a good example. He condensed many hours worth of meeting today and in probably 10 minutes of, of recap. So I think there's that other obligation that if you can't attend a committee, anything the committee says or does or arrives at has got to come back here to be explained, not just by Dave, but by everybody who is on those meetings sitting here listening to Dave, the directive if he gets the wrong get, gets it wrong. And then we have that kind of repeated discussion here before the council, you know, reaches consensus on something. So I don't think that some of that is there, but but then there's the best practices of trying to move a whole group of people forward on understanding is that's very different than what we're probably required to. That's the best management. What should we do? Thank you for bringing this up. We'll follow, we'll keep following this. Um, we'll report back to the next meeting or earlier, depending on the pace. All right. Um, that concludes item six, the committee chair report. Thank you. For those of you that are in the room that need to take a break, just uh, please sit up and help yourself. For the interest of time, we're going to keep moving on for everybody in mind. But we are doing a good on time. Uh, so our next uh, item is the Michigan Large Quantity User Survey Report. Um, Adam Swickle, I'm pleased to have him here today from MSU. Um, Adam is leading a team that is working on uh, the Water Users Group um, manual and and the survey was uh, one of the first steps in that report. And rather than wait to the end, um, we thought that maybe it'd be a good idea to get this out early so that we could have a little conversation, take a little bit more of a bite-sized approach to this. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it off to Adam. Yeah, great. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, this was our initial um, data collection effort into the water user committee. Um, Guide. We're calling it a guide, not a manual. You still have to do the work yourself. It's not a magical manual that will figure it all out for you. It will guide you through the process. Um, but first, we wanted to collect data from actual water users across the state. So um, that's what we'll go through. Um, Jim is manning the, the clicker for me, so I appreciate it. Um, so we this survey went out last year, and um, this is sort of an overview of what I'll be talking about today. And um, it, every any survey is only as good as the questions that went into it. And so the questions that the theoretical framework that we used um, came from the institutional framework for collaborative governance. Um, there's been a lot of research done over the last few decades on um, natural resource management. And the, the, the institutional framework for collaborative governance looks at um, drivers and collaboration dynamics. So what's needed? Uh, to facilitate people working together. So we use this as a guide um, to come up with the questions that we're going to ask and then also um, then, you know, structures how we interpreted that data. So um, we'll just get started with the, the methods and, and, and who we contacted. So we sent out, um, we sent out the survey in two different ways, depending on who the large quantity water users reported to. So um, we first emailed, it was an electronic survey. We sent it out over email um, to MDARD uh, just over a year ago now. And we got a 31% response rate, which in terms of internet surveys is quite good. Uh, yeah. Yep. Is that the total number of large quantity controls in the machine? Yeah, yeah. In just the in, just the MDARD. Okay. So okay. yes to MDARD. And then uh, for Eagle, so there's the entire universe of registered large quantity water users, um, uh, depending on who they report to. So we got, uh, you know, roughly equal response rates across both groups. Um, and when you look at the sample of the, the kinds of folks who, uh, oh yeah, sorry, and we gave people an opportunity, we had a lottery for a hundred dollar gift card to Michigan farm and family, home and family. Uh, farm and home, one of those things, and, or Amazon. Um, most people chose Michigan farm and home and family. 
Um, and if you look at the kind of people, the kind of res respondents that we got, uh, you can see it, almost exactly half were ag water users, and then the other half was was very diverse. So 18% um, of the total was for irrigation for non-ag, but then it's a really big mix. And then if we dive into uh, the kinds of agriculture uh, users we got, uh, you see all of the, the agriculture diversity of Michigan reflected in our water users. So this is a select all that apply. Um, and we got, oh, those are all the categories we had, but we still had 104 others that we selected. So um, we felt pretty good about the kind of representation we got from the people who uh, responded to our survey. So um, diving into what past social science research shows to be important for people coming together to collaboratively manage any kind of natural resource has to do with whether they perceive that resource to be abundant or scarce and whether that resource is perceived to be a risk. So that's what we started out our questions with. And to avoid, um, to avoid you know, pigeonholing people in responses. Our first question was an open-ended response, asking people what they thought the main issue that Michigan water users face. And number one and number two were both pretty close is water quality. A lot of those responses um, had to do with uh, PFAS or legacy contamination or point source contamination. Uh, government overreach, overreach was, was right in there. And then uh, third was water quantity. Water user committees are um, concerned with. And there's a couple uh, quotes that I have here that I feel like frame the diversity of responses that we got. The, the first one by Jim is the idea of Michigan has to regulate water use is not right. We have one fifth of the world's fresh water. I guess this survey is telling me that in the future you will know how many gallons you'll be able to sell to other states. Um, and then uh, we also received this quote the main issue is that the perception. But since water is currently abundant, usage does not need to be monitored. So um, we had folks from both ends of the spectrum um, participating in the survey, which is, as a social scientist, is a good sign to me. Uh, the last thing I want a survey to do is to draw a biased sample and turn off in any, any, in any end of the spectrum. Um, then we asked people's perceptions about how abundant or scarce uh, water resources are in their watershed now, and then whether they believe they'll become scarce in the future. Um, so currently is on the left, and all of our um, uh, results are sort of split up between ag and non-ag. Um, the reason we did that just for this reporting is that with half of the sample being agriculture users, social scientists, I would always want to know whether the the overall results are being driven by one demographic if they're, if they're that far in the demographic. So that's the only reason why we've separated out the stats here. For the most part, they're similar. But you can see that most people uh, view water resources as abundant uh, or very abundant in their watershed, and they don't really see that any scarcity in the future. And someone said, this entire concept makes me angry. It feels like government overreach in an area that does not appear to be needed. Um, and then we also asked people whether they uh, the same sort of question, but zooming out to Michigan as a as a whole, um, and people uh, are largely the same. They they view water as mainly abundant and continuing to be abundant, a little less so overall. And if you look at people's sort of lived experiences, at least what we could do from the survey research, you can see that on the next slide, uh, they're they have every reason to believe that that's the case. So we asked people if they've ever been denied a water withdrawal registration permit, and 92% of the people have said, so 92% of the people when they are interacting with the government for um, access to water, they're not encountering any barriers. So um, our takeaways from this section is that, you know, a majority of water users don't believe that water is currently scarce. It's not gonna be scarce in the future. And when we look at the people, look at the respondents, um, open into comments, many of the people focused on abundance are focusing on the Great Lakes. So um, they're thinking about water at, at a regional scale. And um, in order to communicate any sort of risk of decreasing groundwater that's gonna, uh, that is expected to happen in certain areas of the state or maybe happening in certain areas of the state, 
you know, our research would suggest that you need to acknowledge this juxtaposition. So we live in a water rich state and it's different, it's counterfactual for people to um, be contemplating areas that have water scarcity. And if you don't voice that, then there's an opportunity for distrust. Um, so I say, so research would say showing, you know, showing that you understand, hey, this is kind of surprising. We've got all this great lakes out here, but the water you're taking is coming from the ground. It's a little it's important to avoid that. Um, and then uh, we would also recommend that, you know, a listening first approach needs to be taken. If you're coming to talk to folks about uh, something that you're concerned about, water quantity, but they're actually concerned about water quality or the role the government is playing in uh, water policy, um, it's important to be cognizant of that. And it's important to voice to voice those concerns, saying we understand that these are also issues, you know, but, but this is the role that we're taking here. Um, so water, move, moving on, uh, people are only going to agree to collaboratively manage water at any level if they believe, uh, if they're willing to work together and if they believe that water is a setting where it's appropriate to work together. And if, they, and, and if they believe that working together is actually a viable solution to the problem. So the next set of questions looked at um, precursors to collaboration, uh, one of which is communication. So how often do you talk to other water users in your, in your watershed about water management? Um, and most people didn't at all, or if they did, very rarely. But who uh, are they talking to when they do uh, communicate? We see that it's um, a lot of folks outside the government. So irrigators, well drillers, irrigation system installers, neighbors were the major ones, extensions up there. Um, so it's really their peers in, uh, in how they're using the wall. Um, what extent do they believe their water use depends on uh, how other, people's, uh, other people use water? We see a fairly normal distribution there where people are recognizing that there is interdependence. So if you don't believe that other that your water use in, impacts someone else or vice versa, then there's no reason to work together. So we do see that people see uh, that there is some interdependence there. Um, people don't uh, people say that they don't think there's very much current cooperation happening right now. Um, a third of the folks say that there's there's none at all. Um, but when we ask people whether they should work together uh, to make water water mon water management decisions, uh, we see that there's more support uh, for that. So people are thinking, people are recognizing that little cooperation is happening now, but more should be done in the future. Um, but uh, to what extent do you think water users should work? Uh, oh, sorry, I uh, hit that one. Uh, so if you work together, do you think that that can improve your relationships uh, with your neighbors? Most people thought it could, um, but more importantly, do, they didn't view, uh, next slide, they didn't view that there to be any negative consequences. So uh, we expected that areas where there may have been past social tensions or past conflict over water, you know, sometimes there is a real cost for coming together and discussing uh, water management, but um, we didn't see that in the data. So the vast majority of people thought that there wasn't really any harm. So our takeaways here are that, um, you know, over half of water users believe that their water use is affected by those around them. Um, they recognize that the current levels of cooperation are relatively low, but there's a general agreement that it should be higher. So from uh, should is a nice key word from a social science standpoint because it implies uh, an impact of social norms, which is a powerful uh, motivator for behavior. And so if we recognize, if there's a recognition that something should be happening, then uh, that makes it easier to encourage that behavior now. And importantly, they didn't view any risk associated with communicating with other people and talking about management decisions with others. The last thing that we would want to do is try to encourage people to work together and have that collaboration actually cause more harm than good. And so uh, the majority of our respondents thought that that wouldn't be the case. Um, the next section focused on uh, knowledge of water policy overall. So we started with an overall question. 
um, how how do you how knowledgeable do you feel overall? You know, in general, most people thought uh, they're moderately knowledgeable. Um, however, when we dove into the specifics, we asked about the compact in general. Um, vast majority of people hadn't heard of the compact or weren't familiar with it at all. Um, we also asked about the water withdrawal assessment tool. Um, we see that people are more familiar, especially our uh, ag respondents, which makes sense because they're interacting with that more directly. Um, and then we also asked about um, ARIs and whether they understood um, where an adverse resource, resource impact is, and the um, majority of the people um, had very little knowledge of that. And then finally, um, we asked people what zone they were in or what zone would the majority of their proposed water withdrawals in. Um, so this comes out of the water withdrawal assessment tool, but 93% of the people didn't know what zone they were classifying, what the majority of their wells were classified in. And so our, our takeaways for this section is that there are low levels of water policy knowledge. Um, I would say that's no big surprise. It's a relatively newcomer to this area. It's quite complicated, and it's, it's been a steep learning curve for me. Um, and so I, it makes sense that this would be confusing to folks. But um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there uh, for not only educating about water policy, but using how um, how we educate folks about water policy to assuage some of the risks and and uh, fears that they have. So, you know, pointing out that, uh, well, thinking about the fact that several, many of the respondents, the number two risk was government overreach, and there was a lot of fear about uh, our water being sold to other states. Well, pointing out that the compact's role to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, Perhaps pointing out that this was signed into federal law by a Republican president, and that the water use program at the state level is our way of, of uh, complying with that. But so, in order to in order to keep the water in our basin, it comes down to the what zone you're in. You can draw a direct line between um, the zone that they're in and the compact. That's my point. At the end, that the policy connections begin with the zone. So. Uh, I think I think there's a way in, in our group we've sort of been struggling and, and trying in, in our many conversations with folks, different approaches to educating about water policy, but in a way that sort of uh, can be used in a constructive way. Yeah. yeah. Could you elaborate on that connection between the policy and the so? Yeah, so the, the, I'll, I'll do my best to do this accurately. Um, I can be, you know, I'd be appreciated to be corrected, but um, in Michigan, as I understand it, you know, the Michigan cannot allow a, a, a watershed to go into a zone D. And so understanding your role as a, as a water user, if you're in a zone C, then participating in your water user committee is going to keep you out of the zone D. Is that yes. one more or is that good? Oh, that, that, thank you. Okay. Um, did, did you look at these? Did you ask any questions about what parts of the state they're in to see, to see like, if Southwest section has more familiarity than Central Michigan? No. Or, yeah, we did. There was a lot of concerns around trying to identify ourselves. Yes, exactly. And so we, we didn't know we could do that. Yeah, we very intentionally, we didn't want to have any kind of identifying data. So we would have loved to, you know, that from a scientific standpoint, the, um, okay, and then we ended up with some, some more hypothetical questions about water user committees. Hypothetical because none exist. So um, first we asked if they were familiar with them, and over 70% had never heard of them. Um, so that wasn't a big surprise. So then we gave this uh, the following short vignette. So we explained them using... Uh, language from the, the statute itself. And then we said, you know, imagine a water user in your watershed was denied a new withdrawal and they approached you to join a water user committee. How likely is it that you would agree to participate? Um, I was a little surprised that there was this, that that folks were somewhat and moderately likely to this extent to, um, you know, to agree to participate in this hypothetical work. And then we had an, an uh, open-ended Question to ask why are we not why not and we coded them to be positive or negative reasons. 
Um, the biggest negative reason was time commitment. Um, but then under the positive reasons, there was a desire for more knowledge to understand why why they or their neighbor were getting denied. Um, but also coming back to social norms, there was a lot of responses about being a good neighbor and understanding that we need to work together. And there can be benefits to collaboration and this idea of like, well, if, if my neighbor has been withdrawn, or sorry, has been denied a withdrawal, then maybe that's going to impact me as well. Um, but we also saw, I, we called them conditional reasons, that it really depends on who's convening the work. So we saw a lot of in-group, out-group um, sort of uh, answers there. So for example, maybe if it was a, a farmer saying, if this was uh, another farmer who was approaching me, then I'd be happy to help. But if it's Nestle, which was one of the responses, there's a lot of anti-industry uh, responses. And, um, we we listed several potential benefits and asked what motivated them. There was no clear preference for one or the other. Um, we also listed a, a long list of potential costs. Um, and there was like likewise, next slide, there was uh, likewise no um, uh, clear winner there. Um, can you the next slide there for potential costs? So no, no difference there. So our, our takeaways um, for the book section is that uh, Water users are, are unfamiliar with them. You did next slide again, Jim. And um, from, from the risk communication standpoint, here's a very nice academic term. They would be classified as pre-contemplative. So they have not yet begun to contemplate um, this. And so there's a lot of research from the natural hazard literature, particularly um, this example from wildfires, is that if folks are pre-contemplative, if they haven't been thinking about this risk, um, Research has shown that folks are motivated by information regarding vulnerability, meaning don't come to someone with the water user committee as a solution because they haven't thought about the problem yet. So you need to communicate the problem first, um, and then people are considered knowledgeable after they've sort of learned about the problem. And once people are not knowledgeable, they're motivated by a different kind of information. They're motivated by efficacy, what's going to work. And so that is when. Um, uh, people will be more receptive to solutions. And so if you're approaching someone with water user committees as a solution, um, you know, our recommendations are to make sure you communicate the problem first. Um, and then, uh, yeah, benefits of participation, I already covered, covered that, so the norms, again, they do recognize that there's vulnerability there, so, but the biggest barrier to participation is time. So through this project, there's a clear, need that we are seeing for support um, in, in regards to time. It takes a lot of time to convene a group, to have all these conversations, let alone facilitate a group once it actually comes to go. Um, so finally, I think this is the last section I can just go through pretty quickly. Trust is obviously very important for folks who are working together, um, but we're also, um, we also recognize that trust in the overall science or the tool that is telling you that water is available or scarce is also important. Um, so we asked to what, to extent, to what extent do they trust the science behind the water withdrawal assessment tool? Um, we see overall there's a, a fair amount, um, a fairly big difference compared to other categories between an ag and non-ag folks on this question with ag folks question, uh, trusting the water withdrawal assessment tool a little bit less. Um, but then we also asked to what extent do they trust the state to manage water effectively? And over 20% of the people said not at all. So there's very low levels of trust in the state to manage water. Um, but we also, so then we looked at responsibility, which sort of is another side of the trust coin. And we asked people uh, a series of questions about themselves, uh, their neighbors, and then Michigan water users in general. Do you believe that they use water responsibly? So everyone believes that 60% of people believe that they're using water uh, definitely responsibly. Um, they think that others in their watersheds are probably doing a good job. And then if you get farther out amongst the state, well, then they don't really know. And so um, if, if we're using water user committees as a way to keep water management at a local level, um, then our takeaways for this section sort of speak to that. There's very low, very low levels of trust uh, for the state to manage resources, but they do believe that people that themselves and their neighbors are doing a good job. So 
that the fact to the extent that water user communities can be a way to keep decision making among local users, that's another method of keeping water, keeping water use decisions around people they trust. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up the salient risks that water use that are facing water use in Michigan. Um, according to them, are water quality, specifically new uh, and legacy contaminants, government overreach, and then water quantity. Um, there's a perception that water is very abundant and it's not threatened. Um, overall, their knowledge of water policy is low. Um, but they do acknowledge that water use is interdependent um, and they recognize that not much collaboration is happening now, but there is. Um, some social norms present that would facilitate more cooperation. Um, so that's uh, that's what we had from our survey data. Um, our summaries and interpretations. I'm happy to take any questions, and I could discuss where our project is going in the future if we want, or if we're out of time. So let's take questions for this. So and that's the presentation. And it's a very interesting study. I'm actually surprised by some of the results, of it, especially the openness to participate in the user committees. Um, actually, kind of shocked me. and encouraged, especially the way you teased out what the basic skill is, which is an important point as to how it should be approached. I think that's very good and helpful information. Did you get any sense, though, why the attitude towards the program, especially the state operation? Of the water management is so negative. Not really. No, we didn't ask. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I wanted to have that data, but we didn't ask why. Why? Why do you feel that way? Um, in the in the government overreach uh, category of large of, of the main risk facing water users, um, you know there was a lot of answers there that would really hint at this um, and it has to do the vast majority of those responses had to do with the state imposing scarcity on what is perceived to be a very abundant resource. So I would say that's the main thing that we've heard, but I don't have direct data. Do we have any questions online? Uh, I'm listening. Emily? Thanks, Adam. Uh, great to hear the presentation again. Lots of things to think about with this. In terms of the the same question that we were just talking about, negative views towards government, is that percentage similar to what would be expected? And looking at this, you know, other types of groups that have the similar type of makeup. I'm not forming my question very articulately, but I guess is this type of a percentage a, a common for people to share towards government currently in society yeah um i i was not surprised at that number um i, I the only the only correlate i have is is research that i've done looking at water policy in kansas um where the context is quite different the water policy is quite different uh but i would say there's a similar sentiment there so I think it is a general trend, uh, yes, Emily, that people don't like being told that there's limits to what they can do. And I would say in Michigan, given our one, given the, our water rights, it's even a little bit more awkward. Uh, this next. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, one of the slides that you had asked about early on, I think maybe slides 29 and 30, uh, you had addressed the question of, uh, is there the perception that there's, how much cooperation is there? Um, did you look at that or, or I think, think how to frame the question? Because you were talking about that there was little, the perception was that there was little cooperation. How much need for cooperation have they had? I mean, how many of the respondents had actually been in some sort of a conflict that they did have to have cooperation with their neighbors? I mean, if there is no conflict, then the perception of little cooperation would be 
expected. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So we asked, um, yeah, this current slide, how much do they work together? Um, so I would say, you know, for, for from my role, there's no no judgment here. This is just saying the current the current level of cooperation. And then the very next slide, which then we ask, how much do you think water users should be working together? OK, so the fact that there's a higher mean on this one, there's you know, more people saying moderate and above compared to the previous slide tells me that the people who took the survey in general are thinking that they should be working together a little bit more than they currently that's that's how I would, that's how i would answer that i i was just i was clarifying what the takeaway was right at the end of the at the end of the section whether whether there was a whether people perceive there was a need for cooperation yet or not yeah so the the second thing that i the second question that i it's it's much much more of a general question. Um, you talked about their understanding or their belief in how abundant or scarce water resources are, uh, and then you also talked about um, changing their perception of it. That if this is to work, we need to change the perception. Um, did you get an understanding of where their beliefs? came from why they believed what they believed regarding abundant or right scarce water supplies yeah a great question so i i would um i would use the word perception and not and not belief um and so through the i i, would, I have two so yes and from two sources so one from this the survey Pretty much the only place we could get an idea of how they perceive that to how where how what how am I trying to say this where those perceptions came from would be that open-ended uh, response at the very beginning of the survey where we heard a lot of comments about oh, and we had a final question at the very end where they could just put in any comments where we received a lot of comments about being surrounded with the Great Lakes and you know. Uh, one fifth of the plants, fresh water, and all that sort of stuff. Um, Brockton Feldman is a PhD student who's been uh, supported by this grant and has been working on this grant the entire time. Um, his master's thesis was in this similar area, and his master's thesis actually looked at exactly your question, um, which is how do water users formulate their perceptions of abundance or scarcity in Michigan? And uh, his research showed uh, he, he did farmer interviews um, and his research showed it was driven primarily by personal experience. So if they could see if they had lived near a stream or a river that was always flowing, then they perceived water to be abundant. If they um, always pumped out the same amount of water as they're wanting without any problems, then they perceived water as abundant. And it took some source, some sort of change in that status quo for them to change their perceptions into scarcity. So if the state um, is looking ahead, uh, you know, through hydrogeological models and seeing groundwater declining in certain areas um, and are projecting that before any water users are actually experiencing it, um, then I think that's where a disconnect can, can happen. So one last follow-up question, then I'm done. Um, it, it was a good presentation. I actually had the chance to read the report that you shared earlier. Um, seemed pretty well put together. I appreciate that and the work you put into it. Um, I guess my follow-up and last question would be, um, you're you're trying to write a manual or a guidance on how to operate or run water use committees or water user committees. Um, given that perception is an issue, do you guys have a recommendation at this point yet how to best go about changing the perception of someone who believes the supply is abundant? Yeah, so I'd be I'd I'd be a little wary of like a blanket statement like I I would not want to go on the record and say I'm out here to change everybody's perceptions. Um, I would say that it's important to have an accurate perception of your local watershed, um, and so maybe. Maybe you're in a watershed where water is abundant, and then 
Um, and that, that case, your perception is accurate. So in our uh, in our water user committee guide, we we try our best to put forth sort of that big picture in, in, in an accessible manner. So understanding, um, you know, the water system and how uh, hydrogeology hydrology works in a watershed and where water is coming from that's being pumped and understanding that aquifers can be confined and not connected to Lake Michigan, for example. Um, so we try to, yeah, we try to paint a more nuanced picture than um, recognizing. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I didn't mean to interrupt. You're, I mean, we're, if we're in a situation where there's a water users committee, if they perceive that it's an overabundance, then the reason they're there is because there's not an abundance. So we're, we're already in a scarcity assumption at that point. So that's where the question really, when we talked about this initially and the original committee came from was, what do you do when you get to a room and you have to show that there's an issue on the floor here? And I didn't know if based on your research, there was a way to or you had any insight into how to start the conversation there. As you said, people need to understand that there's an issue. Yeah, so uh, I would say starting with um, the bigger, you know, sort of the, ed the educational component first, understanding um, how the water system works. But then back to our takeaway, it is, it is very important to, to name and to say, we understand that this is counterintuitive, that um, we're not used to thinking of scarcity, and, it, and it's important to state that out front. So that, that would, that's, our, that's our strategy moving forward, is, is um, acknowledging the juxtaposition of that, explaining how the water system works in general, and then zooming into their watershed with, a, with an accurate and local map. All right, I appreciate your candor and your answers. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. I got a question um, comment related to that because you did make a point at one point in your presentation and it relates to what Todd said that once somebody understands what zone they're in, that then they have a better perception. And, and I had a, an experience working with a person who's denied in Ottawa County. Um, they, we were, I was trying to explain the process and how these different zones work. And the question was, well, how do I go about finding out what zone I'm in? <laughs> and I'm like, well, unfortunately, there's no one stop shopping. But I mean, to your point, um, communicating that to um, the water users is critical to understanding perception. So I would hope that we could um, maybe talk about that more as I open, see if there's ways. So I, I have requested and I've received kind of a talk to you status quo of where we're at in Ottawa County. But I understand that takes some time and effort and there's any technical issues with that. But my thought would be is that that would be a great tool. And the user that I'm speaking to said, boy, you know, as a it's a property owner, it would be nice to know what what should zone your employee a property instead of act. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Changes, right? Right. Changes on the in basis, so if someone goes in and they request a withdrawal a day after you've looked, okay. make it could negate right. in the interest that you've already spent, the time you've already spent. On. And that is inherent to some of the technical problems. Why there isn't a solution, but anyway, it's very interesting. Um, and and I, I am looking forward to seeing the rest of your um, work. So with that, could you just give us a quick update on what else you're working on? Then? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, so the final the final stage of our project is to convene two case studies. This is our goal. So two case study water user committees. Um, with our stakeholder advisory board, we uh, set up a list of criteria about how we would choose those, and then we populated a list and we selected Two, uh, one is, is the Dickerson Creek uh, water management area, which is in uh, Montcalm County, and the other is Whitmore Drain, um, which when we select, I mean, this gets exactly your point, Pat, about data and 
when we selected this, we thought it was in one county. It turns out it's across three. So then we so now uh, now it's a little bit more of a realistic real world scenario, I guess, where we're going to try to be working across uh, mainly Saginaw County. Uh, so we chose these uh, two case study areas for several reasons. One being one being that there's uh, a need and that they're relatively small and that they don't have a history of past conflict. So we were hoping for realistic but low hanging fruit for these first ones. Um, convening these groups has been a lot slower than we were anticipating. It's a lot of um, you know, having similar conversations as to this whole conversation that I just gave um, several times with folks um, educating to uh, educating folks about the water policy, explaining what the heck water user committees are, and why we're interested in them. Um, so that's going slowly, um, but in both of the uh, areas that we're looking at, we've received surprisingly positive responses to your, to your, to your earlier comment. So, so, especially for the Saginaw area one, you say there's no history of treatment conflict. Yeah. Just regarding this, or was there no conflict of any sort? Um, yeah, I would say in a, in a more general sense, like not no history of social conflict among folks there. Um, although maybe that's not maybe that's not going to be the case in the site of the area. How did you pick the pool of people that you're inviting to participate? In? For the case studies, um, so the, the the law says high capacity water users. So we have a list of registered high capacity water users, and then also says a representative of municipal government, which we're unclear how we're going to um, define that um, because we there are several representatives that we could choose. So we're still in the process of, but that that's sort of the net that we're casting. Um, because that's what the policy plays out. You have to help department that free though. Because typically those are the the government agencies that are going to be involved. Yeah, we haven't yet. I didn't know that we could call your government or if it'll be for an actual elected official. Oh yeah, I didn't think about that. We I was thinking more of sort of an agency like health department. Yeah, type so of. so the health department often has uh, more than one county has good familiarity with all of that. Also controls the well permits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're at that stage where we're recruiting people and and haven't gone too much far, but farther than that. So Adam, would you anticipate being able to come back to council and give us a follow-up report? Um, sometime in the future. Okay. Fair enough. We'll stay in touch. <laughs> So I appreciate your time. If anybody else has any comments or questions for Adam, um, you know, please, uh, his contact information is up there or else get a hold of one of us and we can get back to you. So thank you, Adam. Appreciate yeah, your time. Thanks. Any, yeah, any questions, feedback, positive or negative, would very much be appreciated. All right. With that, we've got the dessert for our day. <laughs> <laughs> the, the eagle update to, to close out. All right, thank you. So I'm going to start out by giving you status updates on implementing some of the 2020 council recommendations. So first is the Michigan Hydrologic Framework. Eagle, we've received a project budget, project schedule, and a project work plan. And the grant agreement is in the process of being drafted. The request for proposals for the transition probability mapping project is under review in Eagle Finance Division. Lena Pappas recently gave a presentation on transition probability map mapping at the Models Committee. And Lena also has a zip file with a whole bunch of research articles that she's compiled on that subject. If anybody's interested in that, let me or Lena know. I'm happy to share that with you. We have to request an IT review from DTMB for the RFP for updating aquifer properties in the tool. That's specifically the aquifer transmissivity and the
the actual transmissivity and the storage coefficient. The tool user interface improvements are under internal review and probably are also going to have to get an IT review by DTMB. Need to touch base with the data collection committee regarding the long term planning scope of work. We're currently working with USGS to have them draft a new joint funding agreement for additional string gauges and miscellaneous flow measurements. Eagle staff is currently developing some GIS field applications so we can use that to go out and document monitoring well locations for the National Groundwater Monitoring Network and document when we're out there not only where is the well but the condition of the well and if we're able to access the well the groundwater elevation data. We need to meet with USGS to adapt they had submitted a previously they had submitted a proposed scope of work for adding additional monitoring wells across the state and we need to meet with them to kind of adapt that and target that more towards filling in some of the data gaps that aren't addressed by the National Groundwater Monitoring Network locations. They've already talked about this. Um, we did meet with Dave Hamilton and Dave Lush with Eagle staff back on October 2nd. It was a very productive meeting, answered a lot of questions, cleared up some misunderstandings about the Michigan Integrated Water Management Database recommendation. So we need, next thing is, I need to have some internal discussions within the division about next steps, including whether we, as Dave mentioned, is a possibility including the integrated water management database in the scope of work for the Michigan Hydrologic Framework or what does it need to be a standalone RFP. Stay tuned on that. Okay, next thing, the Eagle Groundwater Data Management System. I can't share a lot of details with you at this time because I signed a confidentially confidentiality agreement, but I can tell you that the state received multiple bids for the request for proposals to develop the groundwater data management system. And a joint DTMB Eagle evaluation team is currently doing technical. We completed the minimum qualification review for the bids that were received, and now we're in the middle of reviewing, doing the technical reviews for those bids. The target contract start date is the first quarter of calendar year 2024. Source of funding for the Eagle Groundwater Data Management System is 7.1 million. That's taken from the IT Investment Fund, which is a separate funding source from the $10 million supplemental legislative appropriation to implement the 2020 House recommendations. I was asked to provide an update on Aquabounty. Work on the Aquabounty has been delayed. Um, I'm hearing third hand that they were denied right of way access for their piping, both between their proposed well field, the plant, and then their proposed discharge locations. And what I'm hearing is that that's being appealed in local courts in Ohio. In the interim, USGS and Eagle are obtaining property access from private citizens and local units of government in Michigan to have Eagle Remediation Redevelopment Division's Geological service, Services section go out and drill monitoring wells at locations in the state of Michigan that are within the predicted zone of impact for Aquabari's well field. And to pay for that, we're going to draft a memorandum of understanding between water resources and remediation and redevelopment divisions to pay for that. I was also asked to give an update on Michigan potash. So we have two tool registrations. The first one is for 380 gallon per minute pump capacity, 287 foot casing depth continuous pumping schedule 
The second one is for a thousand GPM pumping rate, 240 foot casing depth, also a continuous pumping schedule. If you have those two up, that's 1380 GPM, which is just below the magic 1389 number that would require your part 327 permit. Hmm. But um, the wells have been drilled, we've got well logs, but Per the well logs, no pumps have been installed in those wells. We've heard from Michigan Potash that some monitoring equipment had been installed in some of those wells, but no pumps. Consequently, those registrations have now expired as of October 1st. When you register through the tool or through an SSR, you have 18 months to make the become capable of making the withdrawals. So if you're talking about a well, that means not only drilling the well, but installing the pump in the well. You don't have to turn the pump on, but you have to install the pump in the well in order to have the capacity to make the withdrawal. And as far as we know, they haven't done that. So those two registrations have now expired. A wetland delineation has been completed in the past on that property, but Last time I talked to our district water resources staff, they have not received any permit applications for construction projects. Eagle Oil, Gas, and Mineral Division did issue multiple Part 6.5 permits for solution mining and brine production wells. And OGMD and the EPA jointly administered the deep well disposal permits. In addition, Eagle Air Quality Division issued a permit back in 2021 that covers air quality issues for processing the brine from the solution mining, converting that into potash and salt. It's also asked to give an update on the Triple M Vela Pit sand and gravel mining operation, which is in Ann Arbor Township in Washington County. So we have a tool registration for a pond withdrawal of pump capacity of 1388 gallons per minute with a discharge to Fleming Creek, which ultimately discharges into Massey Lake. No, 1388, just below the magic 2MGD number. However, their existing pump has a rated pump capacity of 4.8 MGD. So, they applied for a Part 327 permit for that 4.8 MGD. They ended up withdrawing that 327 permit application. In addition, Eagle Water Resources, Water Quality staff in our Jackson District Office and also Water Use Assessment Unit staff went out and did a joint site inspection. And as a result of that, a violation notice was issued for Part 31, which is our general water quality statute, Part 91, soil erosion sedimentation control, 301, inland lakes and streams, 303, wetlands protection, and also Part 327. And they're in the Bella, Triple M Bella Pit is in the process of taking corrective actions to address those violations. Specific questions about the violations of parts 31, 91, 301, and 303 really should be addressed to our Jackson District staff. And I will pause here because I thought, yep, uh, we do have some Jackson District staff participating virtually. So if anybody has a question for the Jackson District staff, go ahead and we'll try to get that answered for you. Any questions? Not seeing any, so go ahead. Thanks, okay. Man. Well, then uh, if anybody has questions going forward, then feel free to contact us about water use assessment regarding 327 or our Jackson District Office about the other water quality and water resources statutes. Our understanding is the Triple M Bella Pit proposed creating two separate systems, one for their dewatering pond dewatering for the sand and gravel wash operation, and then the pond withdrawal that they use. So stay tuned.
Next, the uh, Part 327 Annual Legislative Report <coughs> recently went up. As a reminder, the Part 327 program year runs from July 9th to July 8th of the following calendar year. So in this case, July 9th, 2022 to July 8th, 2023. During that period, 282 water withdrawal assessment tool registrations were issued. 195 site-specific review registrations were issued. 95 of those SSR determinations, there were 95 late SSR determinations that didn't meet the 10 business day deadline in the statute. And something that's relatively in the statute, but we never had anything to report on until last year or two, is if somebody requests a voluntary site-specific review, how many and were they done on time? So last year we had 22 voluntary site-specific reviews, one of which was not completed within the 10 business days. And why people would want to do a voluntary site-specific review if one's not required usually involves some property transfer or property ownership change issues. And for whatever reason, they want the peace of mind of actually having SSR determination. And how many of those were from the same entity? Majority. Yeah. Serious. Yeah. Serious Farms would be one of our that that series. in the previous years. Frequent customer. So yeah, we've got some customers that have had multiple withdrawals on multiple parcels. So as of September 30th, 2023, 192 tool registrations and 141 SSR registrations issued. That same time period of those 141 SSRs, 141 were authorized, two were denied, six were retracted by the applicant, and 18 are still, were still pending as of the end of September. Timeliness. The average number of business days from receipt to completion, 10.8, and 42% were completed within the 10 business day deadlines. And the next graphs, the top one is the cumulative trend over time of the average number of business days, and the bottom graph is the percent done within the 10 business days over time. We also do pre-screening reviews for Eagle Drinking Water Division. Pre-screening review is the equivalent of a site-specific review for a <laughs> proposed increase or new public water supply. So between August 8th and October 8th, seven pre-screening reviews were completed for Zone A, two geology pass, zero Zone C, and one Zone D denial. Sorry, Jim, can you clarify geology pass? Yeah. Geology pass is essentially it's a zone A authorization, but that's where we conclude that there is a continuous confining layer that would separate the pumped aquifer from overlying surface water bodies. So January through September 2023 for the part 327 permits, those are Newer increased withdrawals over to MGD. One permit issued, one application retracted. That's that triple M development I just told you about. And we currently have one application pending with a due date of November 17th. Appliance metrics, January through October, into October. We sent out 78 compliance communications, which could be amended registrations, after the fact registrations, missing pump information compliance communications. We issued six violation notices and received two complaints. What's the nature of the complaints, Jane? Oh, water. Or someone picking a 
bump into the street, like stream right off of Bell Road. So Usually for like directional public. drilling and things like that. Yeah, from the public. Okay, this table shows the status of depleted water management areas as of October 5th. So the uh, relevant column on the far right is the current depletion balance in gallons per minute. So weighted with the most negative balance at the top. We have the watershed on the far left watershed area number, the stream classification, county, the index flow in gallons per minute, and what the allowable depletion balance is, and then what the current depletion total is. David, did you have another question on that? Or? I was going to ask what's the number? 25? And the next slide is a figure that will show the locations of those depleted water management areas. So are there any questions? Questions, Jim. What is you send us a copy of your report? Yep. Yep. And especially that list that I just made. Yeah, I mean, so with that number that goes through the SSR, it looks like it's spreading about 40%. So it's a pretty high percentage. So we're just managing that originally. Yeah, it's just going to that's quite a bit to work on. I'm pretty impressed with getting a lot done within the 10 days. It's, it's actually pretty big. I should remember the replacement. So I, I don't have a particular question, just pulling that out is that's a notable thing that's remaining there. But one question I did have is because what Adam was talking about, with the survey, it said 8% had hit undeniable level two. I don't know what we're talking about. Yes, yeah, it's higher than what the numbers are that I think you see in these kind of reports. The only sense in that was, yeah, did I miss something from that? Is it that high? It looks like it's maybe a couple of percent. It's a very active and denied over all three years. Um, and this is just a snapshot of one year. Yeah. And so you, it's going to be a big difference between Q and the right. Percent of total. Point yeah. Point. Plus, plus the question on the survey was more of a perception based on faction checks. So if somebody submitted one that they felt as though they were going to be denied and retracted, you might add the retracted to well, the report. Well, that's what I'm actually doing. Because that may very well be the feeling of some nice. I wasn't going to get approved. I just didn't go to the phone. So if there's interest, we could look at the recalculate the percent of the the entire time frame of SSRs versus the current year. If there's interest in that. Well, I guess um, one thing's very personal. I don't think we should lose data just because it hasn't been completed in one year. So there should be something that shows the final things were done during this time. So that it is completed, so we know what the people are. Because if you start in, in the next year and you've got stuff that's from year four, you don't report that, you're losing it. Well, the year. ones that are the ones that are still pending are going to be reported in the next program years to report. Okay. So they won't get lost, but they aren't showing up in the current. But so you wouldn't lose any data. I think just like show Right. Okay. Now, there may be some of those retractions are the applicant decides that they would rather retract right. than get denied. No, I, I understand that. I, let's get to the best report. So, as far as the timeliness metrics, a uh, couple things to keep in mind. One is that in addition to doing the part 327, a big chunk, at least a third, of our 
our geologist workload is doing hydrogeology hydro, hydro study reviews and groundwater model reviews for inland lake creation projects in the parts real pond. That's taking up a huge chunk of our time. And that is going to get, from what I've seen, I think that's only going to increase over time as we're getting more these sand and gravel pit operations. The awareness of regulations is only increasing. So and we're just starting to tackle the tip of the iceberg there. Okay, we've got a few questions online as well. Um, I think was it John Yellich first, John? Yeah, Jim, thanks for the great update. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to make everybody aware of again is that uh, MGS, Michigan Geologic Survey, is doing our mapping right now in Allegan and Ottawa counties. We're moving to Muskegon and Montcalm. Uh, what we have done in Allegan and what we've been doing the last two years is that we are offering the ability to put monitor wells in once we complete our drilling. And if everybody wasn't aware, when we do drill, we drill from surface to bedrock so that we get the full thickness of the glacial system uh, whenever we're drilling. And we had two holes uh, last year and this year in uh, Allegan County, for example, when the depth to bedrock was only supposed to be 250 feet. One of them was 576 and the other one was 460. And so we had a lot deeper zones, a lot more aquifer than where the water wells were completed, much shallower up at 150, 160 feet. The second piece is that Allegan County has put a budget together to where we install the monitor well and it costs them a nominal fee. And I won't give you the price, it's just a nominal fee that they pay. And then they're paying for the installation of the monitoring equipment, which we're going to be putting in in the next six months or so into five wells into Allegan County. And as Jim is aware, two of the wells that we have right now are in the state's National Groundwater Monitoring Network right now. Those are the ones that we put in last year that they were in the network. We're hoping that the other five will get put into the network as well when the state applies for their funding from the USGS. Also, Ottawa County is doing the same thing, putting monitor wells in. Uh, we're doing it with our drilling as well in Ottawa County to look at both the uh, bedrock aquifer, Marshall, as well as the glacial aquifer and putting monitor wells in those areas. So we're, they have already applied under their own grant for National Groundwater Monitoring Network input. So at least from an active point of mapping and geology, we are trying to put in monitor wells in certain areas. And as I said, that our next mapping areas that we're, excuse me, we're going to be doing will be Muskegon and Montcalm County. But we're trying to do that with, with drillers. And the last point I'm going to make is that point that I think that you have in Allegan County. I think that's Shelbyville, and we have a monitor well that's scheduled to go in there in the next month or so uh, once we get the driller all set up and everything to do it. And it's right there at that particular area. So those are more comments and questions. Sorry, Jim. Okay, and you just reminded me, John, to a couple points I wanted to add. Um, with respect to aqua bounty, uh, those monitoring wells that Eagle Remediation Redevelopment Division is going to drill for USGS, we're going to have the core sections. They're going to use drilling methods that will retrieve, have the best chance of retrieving intact geologic core sections from those wells. And then once the field logging is complete, those core sections will be donated to MGS for their core repository. We had requested that Aquabai do the same with their wells that they put in. Um, they declined to do that. They said that they would save their core sections, but keep them on the Aquabai at the Aquabai facility. So they'll save them for four, right? <laughs> Thank you, well, Jim. Thank you. Um, we have uh, one more with Todd Easter. Yeah, uh, Jim, if you could back up to the Michigan Potash slide, I can uh, I can give some updates on Michigan Potash. They're actually one of our clients. Um, we do have monitoring out there. We've been monitoring five monitoring wells in the deep aquifer since 2019. So we have continuous 15 minute readings uh, since 2019. We did do a full scale 72 hour aquifer test as well. And I also had a conversation with 
uh, the client about uh, the wells and whether they had to install a pump in the well. Um, because I believe they've gotten a letter from you stating or your department stating that they needed to have a pump in those or they might lose those registrations. Um, so I had that conversation with him late this spring. So it may very well be that they've got those pumps installed or a pump installed in those wells already. But that does lead me to the one question. I was unclear uh, when he called me uh, regarding the letter about the pumps. Um, in a project like this, this is obviously uh, this is a project that's under development. They need to have their water supply taken care of before they can do the rest of the development. This is a massive project. So you're going to encounter delays along as that project goes along. Is the statute clear on something like that where it's a work in progress and we have to ensure a viable water supply prior to doing the rest of the development on the site? Is that is that in the statute that there's got to be a pump installed in that well? Um, it's a definitely a different application rather than municipal that's expanding a system or farm where they're going to be irrigating or there's an immediate need for water use. It was okay. just part of the statute I had not seen or, or wasn't familiar with. Okay, well, since you asked um, in section 32705, Actually, subsection three. Subsection one is the requirement that a newer increase withdrawal above 100,000 gallons per day has to be registered. But that subsection does not limit. Subsection three, I'll just quote. Subsection one does not limit a property owner's ability to withdraw water from a test well. Prior to registration, if the test well is constructed in association with the development of new or increased withdrawal capacity and used only to evaluate the development of new or increased withdrawal capacity, end quote. So if you're installed, you want to put test wells in to do an aquifer pumping test, for example, those don't have to be registered. But that registration subsection eight of the same section, unless the property owner develops the capacity to make the new or increased large client withdrawal within 18 months after the property owner registers under subsection one, the registration is no longer valid. So that tool or, or SSR registration is only valid for 18 months. And in the case of Michigan Potash, they went through probably at least three rounds of having tool registrations expire and have to re-register before they actually drilled those wells. But as far as I can tell from the well logs, there's no indication that pumps were installed in those wells. So, so the information currently available to Eagle, those registrations expired and they would need to re-register those wells. So I don't I don't have the statute right in front of me, but if I understand you, if I heard correctly, the statute says that we have to develop the capacity to produce that water. They have to develop that capacity. You're interpreting that as the well has to be in place and a pump needs to be installed in the well, even if it's not being pumped or it's not hooked up to any distribution system of any sort. It just right. needs to have a pump in it is all. If interpreted having the capacity to make the withdrawal, meaning that you drill the well and that you install the pump, you don't have to turn the pump on. And so begin pumping, but yeah, the pump has to be installed. You have to have power to the well. So you got to be capable of pumping, the, operating the well. You don't actually have to operate it within that 18 months. I think Grand Ledge got, got in trouble with that too, right? Had a well well pumping. Yeah. Well, it's going to be an issue for other sites come along that are big development sites that take multiple years to install. Right. And if you're in this particular water management area, there's not a large demand 
but other areas in the state that are in high demand, that becomes a critical issue for the property owner. The, the water may be available today to register your withdrawal, but that's not a guarantee that if you wait, come back a year or more, year or two later, that the water is still going to be available. There was so, long, there were some long discussions about this at the time the statute was being created um, from both sides. Um, eight, I would say my recollection at this fuzzy point and following that was that 18 was a compromise because there was some fears on both sides. Um, and yeah, you got a year and a half, and if you don't start establishing that well, you can't tie it up forever. And, I will recap all the, the the weird tangents of that conversation and the ways that it could be used or gamed or cause problems, but it's very much a, a very lively part of the statute discussion. So, so Todd, I, we'd be happy to have uh, further conversations with you and your client offline about next steps. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that we actually he actually did have to have a pump in there. Um, I wasn't sure that that was that clear in the statute. I mean, he, he did develop the capacity, but if we do, if we determine that it only has the capacity if there's a pump in the well, um, that was just a change um, from my perspective. But maybe it's just me being unclear. So I'll Thank look it up. Well. I appreciate it. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate that. All right, we're on the coffee. <laughs> so uh, we got some housekeeping to do. One thing we, we don't have on the agenda, but I, um, the appointments, I know there's still some hang up. This, do you want to address that? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I, I guess, first of all, I, I want to clarify, I did recently hear that there may be some issue with the letters that folks got if you are appointed to the council by the Speaker of the House. Apparently, they sent out their notifications a long time ago that they were that they were appointing people, but didn't do the letters right. They didn't proofread them. <laughs> and so a lot of people were ended up being appointed for representing the same interest group. Uh, and they haven't corrected those yet. So um, if you have received if you've received a letter and it's not correct, or if you have not received a letter yet, um, you know, either saying, hey, we're planning on appointing you, please fill out this form from the governor or, uh, you know, something, please let us know um, because we want to make sure that everybody's I's are dotted and T's are crossed uh, and, and we can help it all with with reaching out to those folks in uh, in leadership to to get that clarified. We, you know, we're happy to help however we can. So please let us know. Um, otherwise, you're more than happy to just respond to any communication you've gotten saying, Hey, thanks for appointing me, but I'm representing this group uh, <laughs> to make sure that they're aware of that. Um, we also wanted to make sure that uh, that it's clarified, and I, and I know this got talked about a little bit at the at, at the August meeting that that uh, Pat has graciously agreed to step in to kind of help with uh, with filling out the the third tri chair role. We've talked about this before. Once we've kind of got everybody's uh, appointments secured. Make sure that we that we've got that taken care of. We're happy to revisit the idea of you know you guys want to have a vote or have a discussion about you know who you want to make sure is it is uh, you know is representing the three tri chairs of the of the committee. We're more than happy to do that. Um, but assuming you know well, I don't want to assume. If nobody's got objections, the big thing I want to make sure of first is that we've got everybody's appointments secured um, before we before we have that discussions so that we're not having it and then going, oh, this person didn't actually get appointed. Is that cool with everybody? That's cool. I think one thing that's clarified, I think you could probably just put the record everybody's open to be appointed to revote the tri chair. Sure. And that way there's never any question of the future of the chair. Yep. Yep, that's a that's an excellent idea, and 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 you know again, so long as so long as everybody's comfortable with moving forward, once you've got any clarification you need on on your appointment, uh, then we should definitely do that. But like I said, if you if you have trouble or if you're not able to reach out back out to your appointing uh, to your appointing party, let us know and we'll help however we can. Should be pretty soon. Should be pretty soon though. Finally. Those of us that yeah, Senator Brady Mayor finally sent out their their letter saying, "Hey, please fill out this form." So 
we should let us prevent though. I, yeah, you know, I, I think, baby steps. I think the seven ones are going through like background checks or whatever. So, yep. anything we should know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll find out soon. Enough. So, hopefully, in December, we can talk more about this in the military or you know it's an open issue. So, hopefully, that helps. If anybody on the call or, or in person has any questions, sure, Christine would help shepherd that a little bit, or we would help with the tri chairs. Um, we'll shepherd questions to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> that sounds good. All right. Thank you. I mean, hopefully I can comfortably speak for uh, for both Pat and Brian to say that we're happy to have the conversation. And, you know, if there's folks who are interested in stepping up as a tri chair, absolutely. Um, because, you know, there's nobody, there's nobody who's here for their ego. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm warming the Chamber of Commerce's seat. So I can mean, that's, that's kind of we haven't had that before. So I'm really happy to have you. Um, so moving on, uh, we've got uh, our next meeting date is on the books of December 12th, but we need to talk about what we really want to do going forward into next year. At the very least, we should get a meeting or two on the books. Um, and so the question was, um, you know, looking forward, where, where are we going with, with this two year cycle um, of uh, kind of ramping up toward a 2024 report? Um, so 2023, we could meet every two weeks, we could meet quarterly um, <laughs> I mean, or monthly. Um, I mean, what I, I'm open for discussion. Um, so I think every every two months is kind of the minimum that I think we should continue with. Any more than that, we kind of lose pace and touch. But well, and I'll say too that in the past, and past doesn't necessarily set precedent here, but in the past, we have typically done meetings every two months, except for about the last four to six months before our report is due, which is going to be <gasps> December 2024. Uh, <laughs> so 2022, and I think 2020, 2020 was similar, but basically August, September, October, yep. November, December. Yep, that we've, that we've met every month instead of just every two months to make sure that we're keeping on top of everybody getting recommendations completed, that they get that they get approved by the council, that we can review the draft of the report and get all of the pretty formatting and pictures and all that kind of stuff done so that it's ready to go uh, by our date in December. Uh, so that next December's meeting is party time and we just celebrate that we've uh, that we've done a report and plan on how we're going to shepherd it through the legislature and budgeting process. So if that's OK with everybody else, we'll continue that same format for next year. It would be every other month and then wrapping up as we get closer to the report. And so with February being the first month then that we have our meeting? Yes. Yes. So I think that makes sense. And it looks like they're working with such a meeting with this schedule. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, also along those those lines is, you know, we we in the past have gone out to other places. Last year we, we did a field trip. And so if anybody has um, ideas on on getting the council out and about the out of Lansing, <laughs> the real world. Um, so uh, please let us know. Um, if anybody has any thoughts now, right, we'd love, we'd love to take them. Otherwise, just um, let us know as those main opportunities they come up. Yeah, I'm just going to make a suggestion um, on the off-site meeting locations. If we can have some coordination. The last round, that there was a lot of work for okay. us um, to coordinate at the last minute. Okay. Um, it so, was a lot of last-minute coordinating, people not being able to be there. So that's my only ask. If, if a meeting, if someone does host a meeting, that the logistics, the equipment, everything will be on the person or an organization posting. Um, we just we had to scramble, so it was a little bit difficult for us. We weren't expecting that. So. Well, thanks to you. Thank you for bringing that up. So we want to make sure everybody has the same expectations. So if you are going to host. Um, it's the whole shoot match. The whole shoot match, and we yeah. want a lot of notice um, so that um, you can have a successful outcome. So, thank you for. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
And the last thing is quorum. Um, we we snuck through a quorum today, and normally that isn't really consequential because um, we're approving um, meeting minutes until we approve the report. But nonetheless, um, you know, we do want to try to achieve a quorum on occasion at least. And so I guess as as if, if you are on the council, um, I think it's incumbent upon you um, to communicate with um, Tri Cheers and Christine, uh, Brianna, and let us know if, if you're not planning to be there. Um, if there are um, committee meetings that are meetings that we need to have something approved, we'll make a, more of an effort to get to a forum. But as you can see, we, we have four meeting minutes that we have to approve in one meeting, so it's been. Anyway. And I think probably what uh, it seemed to work pretty well in 2022 when, you know, when we had uh, particular uh, committee recommendations to approve that we'll, you know, we'll make sure that goes out in the in the meeting invitation so the folks know, hey, you know, if you were planning on just logging on online, please don't because <laughs> we got to have quorum in order to be able to approve this stuff. So we'll so we'll make sure and let people know when we have things that have to be approved by the council. Uh, so that you can plan your time accordingly, because I know it's not always convenient to come to Lansing, especially since we love the governor and appreciate that she's fixing the damn roads. We just didn't realize she was going to fix them all right now, all at the same time. So, <laughs> um, so I understand it's not convenient to get into downtown Lansing right now, but uh, but we'll make sure and, and let folks know, particularly as we're working on report items. Right. Uh, we are moving on then to. Open comments. All right. Do we have any? Oh, we have that. Yeah. Email. Yep, we have the we have the email. But um, do you want to check and see if there's anybody who's got open comments? Sure. Who's attending? Yeah. Uh, do we have any other open comments? Attendance online. Okay, take it away. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. So this email was sent to us anonymously. Obviously, somebody is very interested in this kind of stuff that we work on. Um, reading through it, there's you know, a lot of good points. There's some misperceptions, misunderstanding. So my first question is, is the department reaching back to this person to talk to them and maybe explain some of the background, some of the things that they're talking about? It's just been deep files and other things going on. It was shared with the council, so to my knowledge, we haven't reached out to the person. I don't know who the person is, uh, but the thought was that the tri chairs would open our conversation and we can figure out through you three what's your next course of yeah, action. Just as a practice, usually, if someone writes the department a letter, you know, kind of practice to respond, but this one obviously wasn't to the department. Okay, so this is directed to us as a council. No, that was my understanding. All right, but that was a clear concern. So, anyway, um, it strikes me this person is interesting. I can move while somebody talking to them about some of these issues, just to give us some background. Uh, but this remaining anonymous and how to do that. So, I guess that may answer the question because I don't know the anonymous at all. Um, so if I was that person, I think I would want somebody to talk to me about these issues that were really interesting, but I guess I'll leave that at that. The other thing is that this person said that um, in our area in Gratiot County, I know of several of these wells that are dry and they had to drill deeper, surrounding wells not dry and they had to extend. So I'm just going to guess I've asked the department, is there something going on in Gratiot County where there's more of a larger scale? Um, wells are going dry, is something going on? We've had prior complaints, but were they heavy? Were any of those? We've had so, lots of conflict complaints there, but I think the, the issue here is that, I mean, they're spotty. The aquifers are spotty, so in that and then Clinton County, so it's that's just where they have to drill. So, but I don't know if you're referring to the large capacity wells or well, that's uh, impacts. I mean, sort of referring to, and I just right. I just want to see if there's any anything going on that's larger scale. I understand kind of reason why it's not the aquifers, but this was kind of applying. That's what it's like. These are my questions. I guess the question I have is because I'm not clear on whether or not this person's asking for a response either. I mean, they haven't 
really ask questions to say, hey, please respond to me and let me know. But if it's something that the council wanted to try to address, if we wanted one of the committees to kind of take a look at it and like how can we craft a response and, you know, and maybe work with Eagle, you know, on a response and inviting more conversation. Does the department have a way to be able to get that back to that person? I mean, I, you know, if they sent it by email, could you reply to the email even without sharing that person's name? Yes, I mean, we we have we have the sharing has the information. Okay, so yes, and we could reach back out <coughs> to that. We weren't quite sure, but I'll, I'll right? Because it, yeah, it's it's unclear because it doesn't really ask a question, but it, you know, I would not be interested in. Okay. If somebody wanted to talk about some of these things, I would be willing to do that. Someone else might be. I would not want to do that. Yeah. Can I maybe in line with that just propose that um, somebody from Eagle who is appropriate that can send that message, just let them know that you did um, get it to the Water Council. The Water Council saw it, um, took a look at it, has reviewed it. Um, so if they're if their only intent was to share thoughts, let them know that they've been shared. <clears throat> but if you felt that there was a, a light way to say, if you'd like somebody from the Water Council um, would be willing to discuss some of your your thoughts, uh, we may have we may have you know several people willing to do that. Yeah. In that way, we respect their anonymity, but let them know that their comments were heard. I think that's good personally. I mean been around in different iterations for 14 years and despite public comment uh, at every meeting we don't get a whole lot and so when we do um, I think it's important to listen and, and take it for as much as we can. Well and how are we deciding which ones to respond to and which ones not to respond to? I think last fall we had some people or some a guy who was pretty upset. He did ask questions and the general consensus was not to respond. So that's where I'm like, oh, but thank you. This isn't look at the pick and choose type of thing, right? Like there's some sort of policy or schedule or a way that we go, these are the types of things we need to respond to. Here are the things we're not going to, right? Instead of taking these one at a time, because we respond to one, person who really doesn't have questions and obviously doesn't want us to know who they are, right? Versus someone who told us who they are and they asked questions and we really didn't respond to that. So yeah, I, I'll I'll take a stab and say I'm I'm not sure the right answer. I mean the, the official answer right is that we provide public comment for an open meeting. So if people um, want to be heard, we're here to hear them. Um, other than that, when they come in at different venues, there's really no official legal obligation. Um, I think we don't have a policy because it's happened so incredibly infrequently through time. I, mean, I can I might miss somebody, but I've been here the whole time and I think there's like two and I guess and that's with the assumption that this isn't the other thing, <laughs> uh, which it sounds like it is. And so it's happened so infrequently. And I'll say that the, the, the first person, um, and I think several others did, but it's their very first time they began engagement with us. I spent an hour or two on the phone, other people did. So that one was a little different at the last input that you saw. Um, it was more of style and history. Um, this one seems fresh and unique from that. Um, so we don't have a policy because literally it's happening. Thank you for bringing up, Daniel. I think it's a healthy discussion. We do end up staying in the sunlight as much as possible. So, with that, um, if anybody has any other thoughts on how to respond, I think I think that would be great to just reach out. That or any other thoughts with regular thoughts. Right, seeing none online. We can, um, number eleven, motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Support. Yeah, I did. All right, thank you, everybody. Find your alternate ways out of Lansing. <laughs> Good luck.